I had big dreams as a 21, 22 year old kid. I think you're only lucky enough once or twice in your life to be that naive. And I, I say lucky because I think it's like an unbelievable moment in time where I sat down with a pen and pad and I was like, I'm gonna make a TV network. So in today's episode of Deep Dive, I'm joined by the fantastic Colin and Samir. They are the podcasting duo and YouTube experts who for over the last 10 years have been helping people navigate the creator economy. They got their start building a small online network for college lacrosse, and then they pivoted into helping creators make the most of the online space. It was those early videos that I made, which were about lacrosse, that Samir saw. And so when Samir invited me to come to Los Angeles for what was going to be just even three months, I was like, wow, someone will pay me anything, $700 a month to go do this because I didn't study this. So it was a no brainer. It was like, yeah, absolutely. Their main channel has over 1 million subscribers. They've interviewed the likes of Mr. Beast and MKBHD and Mr. Who's the Boss and me. We never talk about the start of the Colin and Samir podcast, which is essentially what has become our entire career, which was in 2018 when we were really down and out having an existential crisis because we couldn't make any money as creatives and decided as almost an act of therapy to get on mics to have open conversations with each other. You guys are the creator economy guys. Like you are the seeming, you've somehow become the experts in the creator economy where you've interviewed people like Mr. Beast and Tim Ferriss and like all of the big names uh, and also uh, me <laughs> on your on your show a couple <laughs> of weeks ago. Yeah. yeah, all the big names and Ali Abdul. Um, how, in a, in a nutshell, how did you guys get to becoming these like thought leaders within the creator economy? What was the... Hmm. Doing that in a nutshell is going to be very difficult. Mm. I mean, what uh, how, how I would describe it is just that it it took us a really long time to figure it out ourselves. And so we found people to talk to, to ask, how do you do it? So it wasn't that we're the experts. We just talked to a lot of people who had done it. Um, and granted, we have been in the space for 12 years. I think maybe something that a lot of people don't know about us is that we uploaded our first YouTube video together in 2011. And that is a long time ago. So we actually have been uploading to YouTube for a very long time and have met a lot of people along the way and have had a lot uh, a lot more failures than we've had successes. And I think that creates an interesting you know dynamic when you have the opportunity to have more failures than than success. And in this version of us, because there kind of have been two, in this version of Colin and Samir, we spent the majority of the time actually helping other YouTube creators, helping them with their productions. And then once we had a podcast and a place to speak with them, they were willing to come on the show to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of it is that we were behind the scenes while trying to be in front of the camera as yeah. well. So I guess you guys have been doing this, this, this YouTube thing for 12 years now, since way before the word creator economy was even yeah. a thing, since way before it was, I guess, around about 2012 was when people really started to make money in the space-ish, from Ish. Mm -hmm. my, yeah. my vague understanding of what's going on. Um, it, it feels like a lot of young people these days want to become creators. Um, to what extent would you recommend being a creator as a career? And what are the, yeah, what are the pros and cons, I guess? See, when I hear that a lot of young people want to be creators, I try and think about what is it that they're seeing that makes them want that. And I feel like, sure, money is part of it. But I think another part of it is confidence in identity. You can quickly assume that a lot of the creators you follow are very confident in who they are if they're willing to put it on camera. And I think those are two very attractive things, like money and confidence in identity. And I think there are many ways to get both of those before you go about pursuing this career. And I think it's important to try and think about how you can pursue confidence in identity perhaps before you embark. Ooh. I, 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 would, I would wholeheartedly agree with that and also say that it's not even some about like us recommending to you if this is something you should do. I think it's just um, there's there's people who can't help it, and I would say that that we are some of those people who just can't help it. We've been doing this since 2011, and as I mentioned, we've had more failure than success. That is a completely irrational thing to do to work on something day in and day out that is not working through you know, your late 20s at times, through not making much money to get together and get excited about uploading a video to the internet is irrational. And so I think that there's some people who just can't help it. And if you are actually that type of person, you will become a creator because you will just keep going. And I think that um, 
you do have to really evaluate what it is you're looking for. Is it the outcome that you're seeing? Is it the outcome of validation, um, recognition, money? Uh, is, is that the outcome you're looking for? Actually, the majority of being a creator is the process of creating. So you have to really understand your relationship with your the process of creating. Yeah, in a way, like, are you embarking on this journey for the sake of the journey or for the sake of the destination? Yeah, because, because I, yeah. I mean, everyone can, you have to see it for yourself, but everyone can tell you that de- there's like no real merit to the destination, right? Yeah. Like the destination <laughs> doesn't exist. You reach mm-hmm. there and then you're like, now I just do more of this. Yeah. I remember when f- I felt like we had achieved some level of success and I was like, oh, so success just means doing more of what we used to do, but in a more comfortable way. Mm. It's the same thing. You know, when we were first starting out, we were figuring out ideas and yeah. then filming them and then editing them and then coming up with a thumbnail and then putting it up. It's the exact same thing we do today. It's just sometimes more comfortable and sometimes more stressful and different problems arise from it. There's a nice um, quote. For, I, th- I think it's from Zen Buddhism or something like that, which is kind of what happens before you reach enlight- enlightenment and what happens after. And so the quote is, before enlightenment, uh, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. I I, I would think of that in the creator economy. It's fairly similar. Like the things that we were doing when we hadn't made made it and we were making videos and making no money are basically identical to what we're doing now and making decent money from the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of weird. I mean, (laughs) even this morning we got a text from our friends, uh, Yes Theory. And there are people who we work behind the scenes with. And they texted us this morning a picture of themselves at a computer editing. The same way that they were doing like five years ago when we met them. Mm -hmm. And yet they've experienced what, maybe they have what, seven, eight million subscribers now? Mm -hmm. Same thing. It's this, like you look at the photo of them at the computer today, this morning, and we just go like, this is amazing. It's still the guys at a computer. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about money. Um, You guys have been doing this for 12 years. Uh, At what point, like how how much money were you making in the early days? And if you're open to sharing, how much money are you making now? Like how did it work? Yeah, so in the early days, none. Um, You know, the way it worked in the early days was we started, I I graduated college and then started a company called the Lacrosse Network, which was a sports media business about lacrosse. My vision was I'm going to make a television network for the sport of lacrosse, a sport I grew up playing, very niche. can't make a TV network, can't pitch it to anyone on TV. So, okay, let's make it on the internet. That, that was the, you know, base premise. I had big dreams, you know, as a, as a 21, 20 year, two year old kid, I was like, I, I didn't, I think you're only lucky enough once or twice in your life to be that naive. And I, I say lucky because I think it's like an unbelievable moment in time where I sat down with a pen and pad and I was like, I'm going to make a TV network. That's a ludicrous thought, right? Mm -hmm. Like to have that thought at 34 years old with everything I know now, I'd be like, I wouldn't even allow that thought to go the next step. Let alone a TV network for a sport that not that many people play. And the majority of people who play it actually play it on the entire other side of the country. Yeah. Right. And yeah. most people probably also haven't heard of it. Like I heard of yeah. lacrosse when I got to university. It's yeah. like lacrosse. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Fair enough. At that <laughs> time, did you think money was going to be something that came? Like that's why you were doing it? it? Was like this is a this is a money thing. No, it wasn't money driven. It was like I'm really passionate about this community. This yeah. community has given me a lot. Like I found a lot of identity in that community. I found a lot of friends. I that was what I did in college. I coached a team. I was like very involved in the community. So I wanted to give back to the community. But I'm not going to say it was fully pure. I was like, I want to be in the entertainment business. I know you can make a lot of money in the entertainment business. I grew up in LA. Um, and that was a huge part of it. That's not, you know, at 21 years old, that's a huge part of it. And I think we talk about a lot that the era that we were in at that time was the startup era. Mm. The sexiest thing you could be a part of or have was a startup. And, you know, when you think about the social network, that movie, you know, Facebook, Snapchat, Evan Spiegel, these are 21, 22 year old startup founders who were becoming mega millionaires. So everyone had, you know, an idea for a startup at that time. Long story short, um, as it sounds like, that was not a quick way to make money, to start a uh, lacrosse-based YouTube channel uh, with another friend and then fly Colin from, you know, uh, Colorado to come live in LA. I mean, this was not a way, a quick way to make money, Um, nor did it ever really make money in the three years that we built it. So how were you how were you sustaining yourself in that time? Yeah. So the the way we were sustaining ourselves was was two ways. One from my savings and two from uh my dad runs a clothing company 
And basically I said, we're a group of creatives, give us essentially a contract to do your creative work. Okay. And we will do the creative work, basically nine to five. Like printing logos on No, like uh, photography for the oh, clothing lines, kind of okay. photo shoots, campaigns, yeah. website design, graphic design, Colin designed the logo for my dad's clothing company that <laughs> like actually just changed after yeah. 12 years. Oof, yeah, painful. it was a 12-year <laughs> okay. logo. It, ran, yeah. it had a good run. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's funny, because looking back, even for me, when I moved out to work with Samir, I did not assume that this would be a company that would make money because I was a member of the lacrosse community. I kind of understood how big it was. Yeah. Didn't fully understand YouTube, but just was like, okay, I want to come out for three months and learn. And I even said in my first email, but I also want to be involved yeah. in some of the other projects, things you have going on. Cause I just wasn't sure that money was going to be a reality. So this is kind of, so a lot, uh, like a lot of people I know who are in like their early twenties, for example, would think that, okay, your twenties are for grinding. Your twenties are to yeah. get the job at McKinsey and to do the consulting thing and to, set yourself up to maybe then follow your passion further down the line. But it seems like you guys went for the, I'm passionate about X, let me do the thing. Well, mm. I'll, I'll back up. I know the question was about money. So I want to be, mm. you know, respond to that question. To give you a frame of reference, the deal with Colin was come out for a three-month internship, we'll pay you $700 a month. Oh, okay. Nice. That was the deal. I don't <laughs> know if you remember that. Yeah, no, <laughs> that, yeah. that was the deal to give you a frame of reference of yeah. where we were at. Uh, and that was a big deal for us to, to spend that kind of money. Um, so just to back up about like, how did this come about? I grew up in LA. I was always into film. I was into, you know, performing. I was into uh, music was primarily what I was into. When I was a kid, I thought I was going to end up being in a band, a touring band. That's what I thought. Yeah. We'll put some B-roll of me yeah, playing the guitar. I, I, thought, I thought that's what the outcome of my life would be. It was like, yeah. of course, I'm going to, I'm going to be in a band. We would perform like a ton in high school. And, um, I had a lot of dreams of, of becoming a performer or some type of entertainer. Um, I went to film school. I, I, you know, ended up being pretty good in my film school to the point where they placed one person in a job in Hollywood and it was me uh, as an editor. And so I got placed on a film called Ides of March. Um, and I was an assistant editor on that film, bottom of the barrel assistant editor, a job that today is done by AI. But I was there to, you know, the, the, this thing, I basically synced audio and video. That was it um, for the dailies. So dailies came in every day. I would sync them and then pass them to the next editor. Um, I sat in a pitch black room every day. Uh, the The distance from the entrance of the studio to the editing room was probably like 100 feet, but I would walk as slowly as possible just in case a producer saw me and they were like, there he is, that's the guy, put him in the movie. Uh, never happened, but I would sit in this room and I just like didn't get it. I was like, this is not the entertainment industry. Like all the editors were in cargo shorts and hoodies and were kind of overweight and just sitting in this dark room. I was like, this is not what I imagined at all. Um, and I, I went out to lunch with the head editor and he asked me, he was like, you, you know, you seem a little kind of not into this. Is this what you want to be doing? And I was like, I think I want to make stuff. I don't know how to explain it any further, but I just know that I'm capable. I can edit something top to bottom. I can also film something. I can also come up with an idea and I can also be in it. And, uh, he said, he gave me the best advice I've ever received. He said, so here's the deal. You are an assistant editor for me right now, and you're pretty good. I like having you around. I will hire you again as an assistant editor, and I'll recommend you to my friends as an assistant editor. And one day in 10 years, maybe you could be me. Is that what you want? I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> and he said, okay, so I'm going to urge you to leave right now and go do exactly what you wanna do. Exactly what's in your head, go do that. Because in 10 years from now, you'll get the opportunity to do more of that, whatever Ooh. that is. And I left. And that's right when I said, you know what I wanna do? Everything. So I'm gonna make my own network, because then I can do everything. I'm gonna, I can film, I can be in it, I can edit, I can make the programming decisions. I'm gonna do everything. Yeah. So that's, that's how it came about because then it was like, so what can I talk about? The thing that I know the most about, the thing that I know the most people in the community that I'm organically a part of, lacrosse. Mm. And where can I take this network? The only place where they can't say no, the internet. So that's how that came about. There's so many ideas that are just spark yeah. sparking in my mind. Um, one of the questions I've been thinking about a lot is what would you do if you won the lottery? what would you do if money was no object? Hmm. And I, 
I often like to, I, I ask myself that question quite a lot in terms of helping figure out like what are my core values, what are the things I intrinsically want to do. But I also find that if I'm doing a sort of having coffee with a friend and they're like asking for advice or any on anything, I'll just open up with that question and be like, hey, you know, yeah. w- w- what do you actually want to do? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's a scary question to answer for a lot of people because for a lot of people they're like, I don't know, like we're so used to thinking in terms of being a cog in a machine, the schooling system and everything like that, that it's if we imagine the constraints lifted from us, it's almost hard to imagine what we would like to do. And often when people do imagine that, they they, they would say some things like, oh, well, I'd love to do music, I'd love to do, write books, I'd love to do art, I'd love to create stuff. But then the immediate pushback in their own minds is, oh, but you can't make money from that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's like a lot of people seem to have these creative aspirations, but yeah. are held back with the, but it's not, it's never going to make money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was lucky enough to be a terrible student. <laughs> and so... I knew I would be a terrible employee. So I, I, it was never in my mind that I could go be an employee somewhere. Mm. So that, that was never an option for me. And my dad's an entrepreneur. Um, it just wasn't, I was, it just wasn't an option. Yeah. Different for Colin. <laughs> so how did, how did you yeah. decide to take the plunge? Well, I mean, I guess if I'm backing up for me, I grew up in an area where everyone kind of went into finance and wanted to be a banker. I kind of thought that's what I would do. I went to college and was a business major coming in in the business school for no other reason than I just thought that that's what you're supposed to do. You go to college, you go do business, and you get out, you do business, you make money. And got into school and found myself like very uninspired quickly by my accounting and statistics and finance classes and bought a camera after I graduated and knew that I wanted to do something entrepreneurial. Like Samir was saying, it was like the startup era when it was all about having your own company, your own thing. And I was like, all right, I don't know what it is, but if I know how to film, I know how to edit, I know how to put up the website, I know how to design the logo, then I'll be leaps and bounds ahead. If I just know how to do all those things that I think an entrepreneur needs to do, uh, then I'll be all right. I'll at least be a little bit ahead. Um, So for me, I just found it, interesting from an identity standpoint. And I went into college thinking I was some sort of way. I was a business-minded person and came out realizing, actually, no, I'm much more of a creative person. I want to work on creative projects. And that's kind of what got me going. Um, So yeah, I mean, when I graduated from college, I was working at the front desk of a hotel. And after I would get off work, I would go film and edit just to teach myself. And it was those early videos that I made, which were about lacrosse, that Samir saw. Yeah. And so when Samir invited me to come to Los Angeles for what was going to be just even three months, I was like, wow, someone will pay me anything, $700 a month to go do this because I didn't study this. So it was a no brainer. It was like, yeah, absolutely. Nice. So you guys have, sorry, go. I I was just going to say, to answer the question about money, the first, (laughs) the first three years, you know, the exposure to the company, uh, I think was around $70,000 a year total. What does exposure mean? Meaning like how much we spent. Oh, okay. Um, because we used one of my dad, uh, my dad had a warehouse he wasn't using in downtown LA and we moved in there, um, which was, you know, an interesting experience. There was like cockroaches and a, a bathroom that barely worked. And, you know, it was, it was a true cool startup experience, but we were lucky enough to have a space because prior to that we were in my bedroom, um, which was actually really fun and cool and, mm. and funny. Um, and like stereotypical startup. I was living at home, so I, I didn't receive any money um, for basically uh, up until we sold the company. Um, and, y- you know, it was an interesting experience because it was very it was very tense, I would say, like within two years. Because two years in, it's like, okay, we have a creative contract with my dad's company. This doesn't feel good. We aren't making any money you know, this isn't, this, this isn't right. Like this doesn't feel right. But what did feel right was we were creating these videos, having a lot of fun creating the videos and there was an audience reacting to it. And I was just like, how do we hold on to this? So then we started doing, we were like, what, you know, we can be a creative shop for other people. And so we did random things. We did, uh, we would make websites for a thousand dollars. And I remember having an argument with Colin and, and, um, Julian, who was, uh, the, the guy who I started the company with, um, about the thousand dollars. I was like, that's, that's not enough. We should charge more. And I remember, uh, Julian said to me, he's like, well, we need to at least do one thing so that we can, you know, have a proof of concept and sell Mm -hmm. more. And so like we would get into arguments about how much we could charge. We, we started building computers for people. We just did whatever we could figure out because we were like, we have to keep this YouTube channel going, but we have to make 
just enough money to get by. Yeah, it was like amongst the three of us, whoever had a certain type of skill set, it yeah. was like, all right, we'll charge for that skill set. <laughs> yeah. You know, whatever it is. Colin had a friend who needed stickers. I remember he came into the, the office one day and he was like, uh, my friend needs stickers. You think we can make stickers? And I was like, yeah, we can make stickers. We charged him 800 bucks to make stickers and we bought them for like 500. So it was like made $300, you yep. know? It's just random things to just keep the YouTube channel going. Um, I think we had a belief that, I had a belief that advertising would come a lot quicker. But again, I was I was riddled with naivete at the time that, you know, yes, people were making money on YouTube. No, people were not making money with lacrosse videos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, luckily enough, we got acquired by a sports media company. And, and when I say acquired, it was an aqua hire. So one of the greatest, yes, there was, you know, money exchanged, but one of the greatest things was that they gave us all jobs. Um, and so we all had jobs at a company and got to continue working on the lacrosse network, but also immediate within weeks, we're working with Dude Perfect. Mm -hmm. And so immediately we were like, okay, now we're working with successful creators and athletes. We started working with Jeremy Lin, started working with um, Giannis, uh, started working with all these NBA players and teaching them about everything we knew about YouTube, which again, in 2014, for guys who had been doing YouTube for three years, we were the most experienced guys mm -hmm. in sports YouTube. <laughs> I and remember having so much imposter syndrome when we first got acquired, thinking, why are they doing this? I'm going to get fired. Mm. They made a huge mistake. Colin Truly. thought he was going to get fired within the first two days. I, I remember a call with with Colin because we were working on something. And basically, immediately, the, the aqua hire meant like our stuff went over there. It got bought by the company and absorbed. So we did keep working on that. But again, it wasn't making really much money. Maybe by that time, we had covered like, I think that year we had made $90,000. So like, at least we were covering our own. Oh, it's uh, like 90K expense. divided by three. Yeah. So you're on like 30K salaries. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. It's not too bad. And that's like year three of the business. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> and how much money are you making now? <laughs> however comfortably you yeah, are sharing now, that. Now, I think I, I actually, this is not a cop out. I don't know the actual 100% like number, but yeah. you know, we are, we are making, you know, in the, in the millions. Um, I would say probably this year we'll cover 2 million, if not a little bit more than that. Damn. Revenue or profit? Uh, revenue. Nice. Yeah. And what sort of margins are you guys running at? <laughs> uh, we, we have taken on a lot more expense this year. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've taken on a lot more expense. We have a bigger office. We have a bigger team. We're kind of in a, in a year of like investing into the company. Sure. So this year, I think our, our profit is less. I mean, one of the great things right now is that I am pretty far removed from this now. We have hired people to help us with our finances. Nice. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it's kind of crazy for me because even as I say that number, I'm like, I don't even, I, I know that that's some, that somewhat accurate, but it might be off and we're halfway into the year and mm. I'm not hundred percent sure. And that is scary, but also really freeing mm. because my, one of my goals this year was to lean into being talent. Yeah. You know, like I want to be good at the craft of being present during more creative projects. I don't want to sit in a creative project and think about how much money it represents. I think also that's after years of, you know, the, the, the era that we're talking about with Lacrosse Network being 10 plus years ago, over 10 years ago, it was no money, no money, got a real, got a job, got acquired, but it was essentially just a job for a very normal salary. Then we left those jobs and then it was no money, no money, no money, negative money, <laughs> no money, you know, a little bit. And then 2022 was it, right? Hmm. The first year that we really hit being last year. Of course, yeah, we yeah, had yeah, deals yeah. that came in yeah. that allowed us to exist. Yeah, but for the first year, we actually made money. Where at the end of the year, it was like, oh, there's money yeah. in the bank. Yeah, yeah, there was a surplus of money at the end of the last year, which time ever was last year, which was essentially yeah, us getting paid. Right, like we we do distributions at the end of the year, and that's when we know how much money we make. Yeah. Right, um, so it, it's a, it's a really interesting trajectory because Colin's right. There was years where. Um, you know, when so basically we we sold the company, we sold the cross network, we um, got into the world of uh, this company, had great jobs, had a really great. I, I call it our MBA. We learned mm -hmm. everything about the creator space. You know what what is referred to as the creator economy was getting figured out in real time in that company. Right, we were learning about how how companies were working and 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 everything. So um, that was a really great experience, and we got I would say overconfident 
in that company. Mm. We felt really good. We were able to grow the lacrosse network to become a profitable division of that company, which was like really impressive to me um, and very exciting. And then we were able to help you know people like Dude Perfect or you know any of the other clients there figure out their revenue monetization. I felt really good. And so we decided one day over pasta that we would leave uh, and start our own thing. And primarily because we didn't want to do sports forever. We didn't want to be the lacrosse guys forever. We we were in love with the process of making videos, but not in love with sports. Um, and so we were like, oh, Casey Neistat's vlogging. He's got a channel with his name on it. We could do it, right? Yeah. Colin and Samir. And uh, I remember everyone at the company kind of speculated that we had some something going on. We were we were we had raised some money, or we were joining another company, and we actually just left. Mm. We just left our jobs. And I think the first week, Colin was like on the beach. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, lost. And called me and he was like, so what do we do? And I was like at home and I was like, I... I think you started directing your energy into your family oh, business yeah, yeah, yeah. very My, quickly after. Yeah. It was like, all right, well, that's done. And now, yeah. you know, I'm needed over here. I'll plug yeah. in over there. And I was just on the beach like, this is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Something's wrong here. So we got together and just were like, okay, yeah, all right, you're right. Let's just start making videos. And we just started making videos, like no plan. One of the most ill-advised things, but again, this was the second time that we were lucky enough to be this naive uh, to just be like, we'll just start it. Mm. We'll just make videos. And we'll see what happens. Let's say you were speaking to um, a, let's say someone in their 20s, they've just graduated university. Maybe they've tried a job for six months and they're like, screw the job. Like, job's not for me. I want to become a creator. What would you, if you, if you had to give this person, if you were their like mentors and you, you were, you were giving them a roadmap, what would be the roadmap now that it's 2023 to succeed in the creator economy? You have to buy the course to find out. <laughs> we can't answer that. Yeah. I'll invoice you after. No, I'm kidding. Um, so as I look back on that, I think the one thing that we always agree upon was that we went into, um, making the Colin and Samir channel with being very like um, selfish creators, which is completely fine. It's like, here's what we want to make. Oh yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Here's what we want. But if you're, if you want to be a creator, then you have to be empathetic towards the audience. And we were not an artist has no empathy to the audience, right? An artist paints something and says, this is what I wanted to paint. I don't care what you think about it. Interpret yeah. it as you wish. Okay. If you want to be an artist, that is a different thing. Yeah. If you want to be a creator, you have to be empathetic towards the audience. There's a balance between what you want to make, what the audience wants, and what the platform wants. There's sure. three things that make up, you know. What you want to make, what the audience wants, and what the platform wants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's something that we call content market fit, is finding, you know, that, that right in the middle of that is content market fit. What you want to make, what the audience wants to watch, and what the platform wants. This episode is very kindly brought to you by none other than Huel. Now, I've been a paying customer of Huel since 2017. I first discovered it in my fifth year of medical school. And if you haven't heard of it, it's basically a meal in a bottle. And in that meal, you get a balanced mixture of carbohydrates and fats and proteins and fiber. And it also contains 26 different vitamins and minerals. And each meal has around 400 calories and 22 grams of protein. So it's pretty reasonable in terms of protein count. And because I tend to be pretty busy and there's always stuff going on, I tend not to really have time to get a healthy breakfast or a healthy lunch. And so I'll often use Huel ready to drink as a replacement for my breakfast or my lunch. They've got eight different flavors that are available. My two favorites are banana and salted caramel. So if you find those, you should check them out. And even though Huel as a company started off online direct to consumer, recently they've propagated amongst all of like the grocery stores in the UK at least. And so I've been seeing it out and about everywhere, which is pretty cool. And very excitingly, we also have an episode with Julian Hearn, who is the founder of Huel back on this podcast from season one. And so that episode was a real masterclass in entrepreneurship. And it was really cool seeing kind of hearing the story of exactly how Huel came together. So head over to huel.com forward slash deep dive. And thank you so much Huel for sponsoring this episode. Episode. This episode is sponsored by Kajabi, and they've actually got something really valuable for all of our deep dive listeners. Now, if you haven't heard of Kajabi, it's basically a platform that helps creators diversify their revenue with courses and membership sites and communities and podcasts and coaching tools. So it's one of the best places for creators and entrepreneurs to build a sustainable business. We started using Kajabi earlier this year, and as soon as we started using it, we were like, oh my God, why haven't we been using this product for the last three years? It's got everything you'd possibly need for running an online course or hosting an online community or building an online coaching business. And it essentially makes it really easy to run 
your entire online business from payments to marketing tools to analytics, Kajabi has everything that we creators need all in one place. And actually you don't necessarily need a huge audience to generate a sustainable income. A creator on Kajabi can, for example, make $100,000 by converting just 350 customers a year, depending on your price points. And in fact, there are creators on the platform that are making millions of dollars every year with fewer than 100,000 followers across the social media platforms. We've been using Kajabi to host all of our online courses since the start of 2023, from our $1 part-time YouTuber foundations to help people start off on their YouTube journey, all the way up to our $5,000 package for the part-time YouTuber Accelerator, which gives you access to me and my team. And Kajabi does not take any cut of what you earn. Creators keep and own everything. The way Kajabi makes money is through the monthly subscription fee. And even though we generate like literally millions of dollars every year from Kajabi, we're still only paying them a couple of hundred dollars a year. And actually in their lifetime, Kajabi have paid out over $6 billion to creators, that's billion with a B, and over a thousand creators have become millionaires through products on the platform. Now, back in May 2023, I did a keynote at a Kajabi in real life Kajabi Heroes event in Austin, Texas. And in that keynote, I talked about the exact steps that I used to grow my business from zero to over two and a half million dollars per year from course revenue alone. Now, people paid for the pretty expensive tickets to watch this keynote at the Kajabi Hero live event. But as an exclusive deal for deep dive listeners, Kajabi have very kindly offered to provide the recording of that keynote completely for free to anyone who listens to this podcast. So if you're interested in getting completely free access to that keynote, just head over to kajabi.com forward slash Ali. That's kajabi.com forward slash A-L-I. And that'll be linked in the show notes and the video description as well. You just enter your email address and then you will get the recording of that keynote completely for free, whether or not you ever become a Kajabi customer. So thank you so much to Kajabi for sponsoring this episode. Okay, so let's say I'm like, you know, I really want to be a music YouTuber. Mm -hmm. I love Kurt Schneider. I love that Boyce Avenue era of yeah. uh, popular song covers on YouTube. And I want to I want to make money on YouTube playing guitar and singing songs. And I'm and you guys are my mentors. How would how would how would, how, how would we be having that conversation? I would say if you want to make money, figure out another way to make money <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to start. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes we made when we started this YouTube channel was that we did not really think about where money would come from. And we assumed that it would come pretty immediately from this new pursuit of creating YouTube videos because we had just come from a background in YouTube. Why wouldn't it? Mm. We kind of thought we understood how that would work, but it, it made us make choices that were based out of fear, taking different production projects and things that took energy away from what we were trying to put into this creative pursuit. So I think if you love music and you want to make money from it, figure out a different way to start to make money from it I mean, so that you can just focus on the creative side. Mm. And, and when it comes to the, the video making side, I mean, the first question I would ask you is who's the audience? Oh, <laughs> I'd be like, I don't know, like uh, people who want covers of Ed Sheeran songs on YouTube. Okay. And how much of that is available to them? Like, I would loads of people are doing Ed Sheeran mm, covers. Right, so I'd ask yeah. you to scan that, right? <laughs> yeah. And say, okay, cool. Now go study who else is doing what you want to do. Yeah. Why are they watching? What's interesting about it? You oh, know, like, okay, start, yeah. do they have space to watch five of these in a row? Is that the culture of this audience? Where else do they hang out on the internet mm -hmm. outside of um, YouTube? And a lot of what we've learned, I would say, over the past 12 years is this process of studying audiences. Because we are, again, we are part of the equation, but the audience is, we're playing ping pong mm -hmm. with an audience, right? That's what the internet is really great at. We throw something out, the audience reacts to it. And we understand, oh, interesting. That's what you what you guys like. That's what you didn't like. Okay, let me try this. Ooh, okay, now I just learned something new about you guys. Mm -hmm. So creating, being a creator for the internet is a collaborative process with the audience. And so you have to deeply, before you embark on this journey, define who you're speaking to and understand them. It's okay for that to evolve. I don't want to say that you have to put yourself in like a very tight box in the beginning. But that's the first question I would ask you is lead with who you are speaking to why is it valuable to them? Because yep. you are asking people to invest time in your Ed Sheeran cover. Yep. So what's their return on that investment? How does it differ from what someone else is offering? Mm. It's like somewhat similar to just general entrepreneurship or yeah. launching a product. Yeah. Like, is there enough space for you in this market? If you are going to enter that market, are you different? Are you singular? Do you stand out? Or are you replaceable? And a lot of times you're not going to, you, you should think about it up front and you should figure that out. But a lot of times that's going to come from starting. Mm. But I do think sometimes people would get leaps and bounds ahead if they were more aware of the market they were entering or the space before they did it. Yeah. Yeah. The way that I, I, I think of this, that I, that, that I teach this in our course is, um, you know, sort of three levels, level one, get going, level two, get good, and level three, get smart. 
<laughs> so get going, I would say, is like the first three videos. Just like put the videos on there. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Yeah. Like don't overthink it because yeah. loads of people get stuck in overthinking, um, especially if they've come from a, a background where they've been to university and done well sure. or they've or already been in a job and done well. Suddenly to go into YouTube, it's like, oh, the overthinking stops them from doing, from doing anything. Mm -hmm. so just make a handful mm -hmm. of videos, see how it feels, see what the vibe is. And then I would say level two is get good, which is still while you have a day job. Like get good at the craft of actually making videos and get to a point where the stuff you're making no longer makes you cringe. And as soon as you stop cringing at your stuff, that means it's reached some level of internal quality. But if you start getting responses from the audience, like like comments, subscribes, whatever the thing might be, that's an external barometer for is the thing you're making actually good. Mm -hmm. And at that point, now that you know how to make a thing that is good, then we can worry about like, are we treating this like a hobby or are we treating it like a business? If it's a hobby, do what you want. Have fun, do your edge your own covers, no one cares. Yeah. If we're treating it like a business, a business exists to serve an audience. Agreed. Agreed. And therefore, yes. like, yeah. all the things around treating it like a business. I, I would say that's the other, you know, th that's the question before the question about the audience is like, why Why do you want to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Is it is it a hobby or is it, do you have commercial intent? Or do you not know yet? You don't have to know when you start. You know, like commercializing your creativity is a very complicated thing to do. It's not clean, you know, it's not a clean process. What do you mean? Creativity is a very, at least for me, like coming from, you know, growing up and, and playing music. I think about the concept of writing songs and how enjoyable it was to write a song. And think about how like songs would just come. I had a lyric book. I would write. I would just kind of enjoy the process of writing music. Um, if that became a commercial thing right now, I don't know what my relationship with that would be if I had to do it, right? Or if someone pays you to do it. And if people start paying you to do it, you all of a sudden are evaluating your ideas based on a value system that is quantitative. Mm. And a quantitative value system, as we all know on YouTube, is a, uh, it's a very just, I think it's a tricky thing to do with your creativity. You think about a creative video idea. You're like, I love this idea. You put it out, it tanks. Do you still love the idea? Or did something just happen? Did something just change about it, what you feel about the idea? You know, like you finish the video, you love it and you put it out. And based on if it's a one out of 10 or a 10 out of 10, you, your emotions towards it might yeah. change dramatically. Yeah, right? there are videos that I've put out that I've thought this is really bad and it does well. I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know what? Yeah. It was good all along. Yeah. And, and you know <laughs> and what? The around. I actually yeah. love that video yeah. now and I would do another one. Yeah. So that just immediately, you, you, when you have performance-based creativity, it's a completely different thing than creativity. Have you ever worked with a creative person, hired a creative person who's not motivated by money? <laughs> you may not attract that type of person. I don't think so, yeah. honestly. Yeah. Like, like even hearing you guys talk about creative stuff, that's completely the opposite world mm. from where I've grown up, which is all about like... Yeah. Imagine, yeah. Like, yeah. imagine working with someone who doesn't care about the paycheck. They really care about the final outcome of the work in the way that they would prefer it to be. Oh, I have students That's like this on my YouTube academy. It's so frustrating. <laughs> I've when heard they, about these people. <laughs> yeah, when they say, why is my channel not growing? And I'm like, it's like yeah. who's, the, who's the audience? Like, yeah, what's, yeah. like why should someone watch you? It's like, oh no, but I, I really wanted to make this. And I, I think it's really, I think my message is really important. Yeah. Okay, but like, clearly other people don't. So like, <laughs> like I think navigating people that. mistake the, sometimes creatives mistake what's happening on YouTube for creativity. Uh, Ooh, and, and that's, that's good sound you know, not I mean, that there isn't a lot not, of creativity yes, on no. YouTube. Yeah, not that there isn't. But again, like, let's take a look at the film industry. Yeah. Why are there so many Spider-Mans? Because it's commercially successful. It works. Because yeah. it puts butts in seats. Okay, that's just like the simplest thing I can say about the film business, right? Mm. So if you want to be in the film business, if you were to decide, I want to be in the film business, you're playing by those rules. What puts butts in seats? If you want to be a filmmaker, you can be a filmmaker, but you might not play with the film business. It might yeah. intersect a couple of times, but those are it's okay for those to be decoupled. Yeah. Right? It's and like I, how it's like how someone who enjoys making coffee is very different to someone who runs a profitable coffee business yeah, or a mm -hmm. coffee shop. Yeah, of course. Completely different completely things. Completely different things. Which yeah. with like minor overlap, but like broadly yeah. completely different <laughs> yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, different <laughs> things. Um Colin, Colin said this to me one time. He was like, I think uh we we thought YouTube was about monetizing self-expression, but it's not. Does that it, make sense? It can be, yeah. of course, within certain confines. And in many ways, you look at our channel, what we're doing right now, your channel, sure, you are monetizing a bit of self-expression. But 
there are compromises, which gets increasingly more difficult when you're compromising on yourself. Mm, yeah. Yeah. You know? And, and all this to say, we found a format that, for me at least, I feel has allowed for me to be myself and an uncompromised version of myself and have that intersect with commercial viability. And I feel really lucky about that mm -hmm. because there was a lot of versions of like attempts at YouTube that I was not, I was not being hundred percent myself, you know? And I, I, if I was good at not being myself, I would have pursued acting, which I wanted to do, <laughs> but I wasn't good at it. I can't pretend for that long. Um, and so I'm, I feel very grateful that we found a format where it's like, when you watch our videos, like I, that is me. I am Samir in that context. When I'm playing a role, like we had coffee with James Hoffman before this um, at his coffee shop and we spent three hours with him. Basically, it, funny enough, felt like we did a podcast without recording it. It's like, it's mm -hmm. exactly the conversations we enjoy having. It's exactly the people I'm interested in. It's exactly how I show up in those conversations. And I feel really lucky that that is what we get to, to do. But for the record, I'm a paid actor. <laughs> yeah, just to make sure that that's yeah. clear yeah. for everyone listening but and I do have to ask myself, how many of these conversations would I do if there, if it wasn't tied to, you know, commercial success? How much would I upload? How much, you're right, like you, you do have to think about that too. It's like, okay, is this, what you know, and that's what running a creative business is, you know? And I think that's, that's the thing. The advice I would give is like, just get really smart on understanding what making it means to you, like what is making it to you? What is what does that mean to like make it on YouTube? What are you imagining in your head? And then also like, you know, do you deeply authentically care about providing value to the audience that you've told me you, you want to have? Because if you do, then you can have a long career. Um, mm. Then you're going to wake up every day and be like, okay, this lifestyle is really enjoyable. The process of making videos is really enjoyable. I get to do the thing I'm passionate about. I feel like myself while I'm doing it. And the people on the other side are really happy. And I I get joy from providing value to them. You can make some some sorts of businesses work and some sort of like, a, you know, a lot of people have jobs of which they're not fully passionate about. Yeah. But, you know, it makes money. It gets them by. To what extent do you guys think that passion is a prerequisite for success in creator, creator economy land. I think it really depends what type of person you are. Yeah. You know, if you're motivated by metrics, if you're motivated by dollars, the message or the medium or, or what you're putting into the creative side is not as important. So you're, it's easier for you to compromise. It's easier for you to make decisions that will allow you to be financially successful. Also, the, yeah, the passion that you have is towards uh, entrepreneurship or making money. That's a completely fine passion to have. Hmm. You know, and like if the pro we've met creators who say I am an entrepreneur just happens to be that my product mm -hmm. is video. And I think that's a completely fine thing. I just think all of this is like a process of self-discovery and self-awareness of like, if that's the case, that's completely fine. You're going to make different decisions about video, you know, and that's that you're going to make different decisions than I would. But I have to understand that I'm the type of person that deeply cares about the craft of the video and what it looks like, what yeah. it sounds like what goes out to the, the people on the other side. I deeply care about that. And I would sacrifice um, the numbers on the screen going up uh, in exchange for me being happier with the video. Mm. Yeah, it's like this, these different approaches. There, there are some people that approach YouTube or whatever the platform is from the perspective of a creative trying to make yeah. money. Yeah. And then there are others that approach it from a perspective of an entrepreneur trying to make money who's yes. recognized that there's a niche and there's like a Ooh, I can make a faceless YouTube channel with AI and stuff. Exactly. And that yeah. Capitalizes on this high CPM niche <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> I think we, um, th when the term the creator economy came, I think it was in like 2020, maybe it was the first time I had heard it. Yeah. Um, and it, it was so funny because it was the first time I was like, oh, wow, there's a name for the thing that we talk about. People are calling mm -hmm. it something that's interesting. Um, but I think that word creator got way too used in a way that assumes that everyone is the same. Mm. Like every creator is the same. But I think the word creator is very mm. similar to the word athlete. Like if I said, this is a show for athletes, you would say, what? Mm. What kind of athletes? Mm, yeah. Right? And I think that's what the term creator is like. I think there's like it, with an athlete, there's tennis players, soccer players, basketball players, lacrosse players, and they all have different wants, needs, yeah. training regimens. And there's amateurs and professionals yeah. and like semi-professionals yeah. and, semi and all of those. And like, yeah. all that. Yeah. So the amount of variants there are in the term athlete, I think there's that many, if not more variants in the term creator. 
Yeah. And I think we we oftentimes assume differently. Yes. That's a really good point. This is partly why, like, you know, when, like, I really struggled to make videos like how, how to succeed as a creator in 2023. It's like a good title. And it's like, oh, we know it's going to, it might do well, but it's like, oh, how do we even begin to talk to all these people? And so even the title for this podcast episode, I was thinking, it was like, how to succeed in the creator economy. Okay, I can get why we would title it that. <laughs> but also like, okay, where where do we even begin? Like, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. yeah. And, and what I found, and I'm curious to hear you, your guys' thoughts on this. What I found is that like, I, I really struggle to, like, if someone asks me, how do you succeed on YouTube? All I really know is my own playbook of educational talking mm-hmm. head videos, providing value to a small niche of people, monetizing it through a course on the back end and doing that for six years. That's a pretty reasonable formula for success, in my opinion, provided you have something, some sort of expertise, something to teach in a market that's not, that's not so saturated that mm-hmm. you can't stand out. Mm-hmm. But you guys speak to, for example, Mr. Beast or yeah. Dream and people like yeah. that who have made it in the creator economy in a completely different way. So I guess my question for you guys is, of all the people that you've interviewed and spoken to about this stuff, do you see any, like, what are the commonalities you see amongst the creators who manage to make it professionally yeah. versus the ones who either just keep it as a hobby or who, who like, quit after a while? Uh, for me, it's focus. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Focus. Yeah. Like, when you talk to, you've, you've spoken to Marquez. Marquez Brownlee is someone who is, like, you think about some of these people and the amount of opportunities that they've had to expand into other directions. And the ones that really remain focused on uploading videos consistently <laughs> are the ones who win. Like, and I, I speak from a, a place of, um, you know, experience of as we started to see some traction, I was like, took a pen to pad and I was like, great, now we can launch this business and this business and this and this and this. Mm-hmm. And if we expand like this and hire these people, then we can do that. And you lose focus pretty quickly. And I would say discipline rides yeah, right alongside fo- that. Focus and discipline, like those, th- the ability um, to uh, have focus, discipline, even when we talked to Jimmy recently, right? Like uh, Mr. Beast is refocusing in on main channel and Feastables. Those are the two things. And th- that's a lot. Running a massive chocolate company and a the, one of the biggest entertainment platforms in the world. Even that is a lot, like- you know, even that mm-hmm. is too much for for one person, and he has a lot of help to do it. So, he's someone who's told us many times: focus on making the best next video, and the world will open up to you. You know, and I I, I agree on that. And I think sometimes creators eject out of that way too soon, mm. like eject out of that focus too soon. Like I look at Colin and Samir, and although it might feel in a way to some people, maybe someone listening. Uh, that, oh, that's an established brand in the space. We are brand new. We are a brand new brand. I oftentimes think about companies. If you think about a company like a toddler, right? Or like a baby, a one-year-old company, can you leave that alone and like allow it to fend for itself? No. A six-year-old? No, right? We Six years ago was our first upload. And I would say we really came about in 2020. So we're like three years old, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So so you have to actually continue to do the fundamentals of just keeping this thing uh, alive, allowing it to develop. Um, and I think we overestimate a lot of times like how much we can do and how much we should do. And again, I'm speaking from a space of experience mm-hmm. myself of um, really having to learn how to refocus and, and really having to have discipline on like, we are going to do this. We have a lot of brand building to do. Um, we need to be best in class at what we do first. And maybe that's it. Maybe we will never expand beyond that. But let's try and be best in class. And can we focus enough? Can we be disciplined enough to be consistent? Mm-hmm. Because that's really difficult. I think some of the top creators are all consistent. They found a way to be consistent, even though, in our opinion, creative people are often not consistent people. We ourselves are not <laughs> consistent. I do think that's our biggest struggle. Can we focus enough? Can we be disciplined enough to remain consistent? Because even now that we've found a format and we're two years in, every day I wake up and go, oh, I could do that. <laughs> How do I make space to do that thing over there? What if we cleared three months to do that? Mm. And things that are sort of not in what you what probably anyone who would be looking at us from a business perspective would recommend. How does this tie in? Okay, so I, I have two thoughts here. Both are somewhat garbled. The first is a, a fear that I often have that I've had for a while, 
and I'm only just realizing it if, as I put it into words, is that what if I got a lucky break? What if, you know, it's it's unusual to see a YouTuber who is relevant today who was relevant 10 years ago. Outside of the tech guys, like there's very few people who've managed to sustain that longevity. Audiences are fickle. Audiences, thingies change, like, uh, you know, vibes and uh, preferences change over time. What's to say that if I just continue making videos consistently, actually next year or the year after the year after that, I'll, I'll, still, I'll still be relevant, I'll still be around. Therefore, should I not focus on diversification and trying to build a platform off of YouTube and trying to build all these things just in case I'm not in fact relevant, I become a has-been two or three years from now? That to me is like, uh, and again, I'm gonna speak from a, a deep place of experience. That is like very fear-based thinking in my opinion, right? Like you're, there's something that you're afraid of there, of, of becoming irrelevant. Yeah. Um, I think that like my experience right now is like I've I've somehow worked out a way to relinquish a lot of that fear. Oh, how, uh, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, a mix of uh, you know like being married to a therapist, a <laughs> uh, lot of journaling, and uh, uh, slight help from psychedelics. But um, I would say that like relinquishing some of that fear around e e scarcity and abundance. It Ooh, is, yeah. is what I'll say. So yeah. I've grew up in a very scarcity mindset environment, right? Mm -hmm. Growing up in an immigrant household, yeah, especially same. immigrant, I'm uh, sorry, especially Indian immigrants, right? Like coming to America, like it's scarce, scarcity mindset. You know, my my parents and I, I assume that there's a lot of trauma from the partition um, that that came through and that is like, we have to acquire everything and hold on to it. And what if it all goes away tomorrow? Because that did happen, Yeah, right? That did happen. But- um, as I've, you know, come into this space, uh, I've, I've started to learn that we are in a abundant environment and not abundant from a dollar's perspective. I could, we could not make any, I think money comes and goes and like, it could all go away. Um, but I'm in an abundant environment because of the people that I know and the network that I've built and the skills that I have. I have an abundance of skills. I have an abundance, uh, in network and I have abundance in just my own ability to know how to utilize that network and utilize my skills. So if everything went away, do I actually believe I am the type of person that would let all of this fall, right? And that would actually let this hit, you know, rock bottom in some way? Like, what am I afraid of? Because my worst case scenario is not that bad. And there's a lot of people I could call along the way of falling down that, right? So if I'm operating at a space of fear, it is actually incredibly irrational because there's nothing to be afraid of. So if I can relinquish some of that fear, what, what does the world look like? And this is, we were talking about this at lunch. I got to speak with a business coach um, at, the, um, at the Spotter Summit. So Spotter is a company that, I don't know if you're familiar with Spotter. Um, they're a company in the US that, that works with creators and gives creators financing. Uh, and we, Colin and I, helped co-host a summit where we brought experts in to talk to creators. And we got to reap the benefits of that as well because we got to sit down with a lot of the experts. And one of the experts there was a, was a business coach. And I was explaining this to him because I was dealing with a lot of scarcity mindset. I was making a lot of decisions out of fear. I was feeling an incredible amount of fear to the point where I couldn't sleep. Um, because we had built something. And when you build something, you have something to lose. Mm. And I was terrified of losing. And he said something that was really powerful to me. He was like, you have entered into a world of abundance. You are an abundant version, or you don't know the abundant version of yourself. You don't even trust the abundant version of yourself. The scarcity mindset version of yourself got you here, helped mm. you achieve a dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you don't trust abundant Samir to make a decision for you, to take you to the next place. Because that person is brand new, that's a stranger. And he said to me, the same amount of time you need to build trust with a stranger is going to be the same amount of time and work to build trust with this new version of yourself. Mm. Real business coach thing to mm -hmm. say. Really yeah. good. And I loved it. Yeah. And that's when I realized I was like, okay, there's a new version of myself that I'm coming into, but that's gonna take a long time. And it's still, you know, it still manifests in a space of like, when we get offered a brand deal, I'm terrified to say no, terrified, you know, if I say no, they'll give it to someone else and then they'll like that experience and then they'll never work with us because they'll only work with our competitors. And then 
you know, and that's that's incredibly fear based. So I always have to take a step back and go, am I making this decision out of fear, or am I making this decision because it's the decision that we want to make, that we are excited about, that sounds fun for us, that is a decision from abundance. Um, I'm not saying we nailed it, but like we are we are working on that, or I am working on that personally. For me, I also want to be honest and say that it's way easier to think about dealing with irrelevance if it were to come tomorrow because we have found some relevance. <laughs> True. Mm. <laughs> Just being fully transparent. You know, when we, back in 2019, we had negative $18,000 in our bank account. We shut down the company, essentially. I moved home. We had yet to be successful, and it really hurt from an identity perspective, an ego perspective, confidence. I didn't know where I would work, what I would do, what value I could bring to anyone. And because we were able to find some success in 2021 and then in 2022, cross over a million subscribers, have people call us your favorite creator's favorite creator, things like that. To get that validation, if it were to all go away tomorrow, I'd go, okay, at least I can close that chapter knowing I did it. Of course, I don't want to wake up tomorrow and be irrelevant. Mm. But there's a sense of calm that comes from feeling like we, quote unquote, made it after so many years of thinking we could never. Now, this season is once again being sponsored very kindly by Trading212. Now, people ask me all the time for investment advice uh, because they see that I've made money and I've made videos talking about where I'm investing that money. The thing that Warren Buffett and basically everyone who's sensible in the space recommends, which is to invest in broad stock market index funds, which you can do completely for free using Trading212. Trading212 is a fantastic app that lets you invest in stocks and shares and funds in a commission-free fashion. And they've got a bunch of features which are really helpful, which is why I personally use Trading212 to manage a portion of my portfolio. So firstly, they've got this great pies and auto invest feature. So if you're interested in potentially getting into investing, what you can do is you can browse the different pies that different people have created on the platform. So you might get like a hedge fund trader who's gone onto the platform and has created a pie of investments, having done a bunch of research and stuff. And that pie might be like, I don't know, 20% Apple, 20% Tesla, 10% this, 10% that. But it's generally way more complicated than that. And you can see the performance of that particular pie of stocks and shares and funds. And then if you want to copy that pie into your own account, you can just copy and paste it directly in. And then you can invest any amount of money and it will automatically split it according to the allocation in the pie. So if you wanted to just play around with hundred pounds and you were like, okay, that pie looks good. It will split out that hundred pounds based on the allocations of the pie, which is pretty sick. They've also recently added support for multi-currency accounts. Now this is really helpful because for example, if you invest in the S&P 500, which is a US based index fund, then you won't get hit with all the various foreign exchange fees. If for example, you're investing from the UK like I do. And if you have an invest or an ISA account, then Trading212 also gives you daily interest on your uninvested cash in pounds or euros or US dollars. So if any of that sounds up your street, then do please hit the link in the video description or in the show notes, and that will let you sign up to Trading212. And if you use that link, you will also get a completely free share up to the value of £100. So it's literally free money, so you might as well. So thank you so much, Trading212, for sponsoring this episode. This is so interesting. Like we were, I was having this conversation with the, the team yesterday. We were, um, so we're about to launch, launch my book, and we were thinking like, what do we want the pre-order bonuses to be? And one of my thoughts was, Let's make a $300 productivity course and just give it away for free as a pre-order incentive. Because mm. that's a grand slam offer. Yeah, it's like you can pre-order the book for $20 and you get a $300 course. Mm -hmm. Sick. Amazing. But then there was some pushback from the team um, around, but like, are we really going to give away this $300 product? Like we could make money from it. Like how do we know we don't need the money? Like, you know, our YouTuber Academy is now yeah. stopped. And and mm. Tintin, our YouTube producer, who we met earlier at lunch, um, said, guys, it, it seems like we're, 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 we're we're, we're having this conversation from a place of fear. Mm -hmm. Like, what if we just decided to bet on ourselves instead? Yes. And in which case we would make a decision that's like best for the audience, that is more from a place of abundance. And we would give away this course because like, why not? We might as well. Yeah. But from a place of fear, it's like, oh, the 5,000 people who pre-ordered the book, they're the warmest audience. They might buy this course for $300. That's like 15K we're losing out on. Like, oh, oh my God. And it starts to spiral into this fear-based yeah, I, I would say also like, you know, we are incredibly lucky to talk to people for a living and Tim Ferriss is one of those people and he talked about the concept of fear setting, which I think is like one of the most important exercises I've ever heard about. I, it, it has stuck with me and it is something that I actually use, um, which if you're unfamiliar with it, the concept is the same way that we would goal set, we should also fear set. We should write down our fears and then actually play them out. He has a framework. It's on his website. I would recommend you check it out. Um, but essentially like you write down the fear, then you write down, um, 
you know, how you, you essentially take it. You're like, all right, for example, I just did a 10 day vacation and I have in the past had a lot of fear around vacation. Vacation is terrifying to me. What if, so here's one of my fears. What if someone emails with an opportunity and I'm not at my email? Okay. Well, that's a, I, even as you hear it out loud, that's a ridiculous fear. You just <laughs> route it to your agent or route it to Colin or route it to someone else yeah. to read it. And then it's, okay, well, what if it's an opportunity that we want, but I can't do because I'm on vacation? Well, if you value vacation, then you yeah. are, that is a reality that's going to happen. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. That's not actually that bad. Yeah. Uh, and then you, you just keep going down. Okay. How could I re repair it? Quote unquote. Well, we could just email them and see if we could do it when I'm back, right? It's just like, there's so many, it, it sounds ridiculous yeah. as you go down and you start to realize like, oh, these fears are just, I haven't thought them through yet. Yeah. They're very surface level. And so they're, they're, um, eating at me because my imagination is so powerful and I'm, I'm yeah. a storyteller inherently. So I'm able to tell myself mm. a completely invalid story. Um, but if I live it out and write it down, it's like, no, oh, okay, actually it's completely fine. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, has been incredibly yeah. helpful. Oh man, I love the fear setting exercise. Yeah. Any, anytime I feel any sort of existential crisis about my business or anything, I just Google Tim, Tim Ferriss fear setting, <laughs> literally <laughs> just go through it, type it all out. And I'm like, at the end of it, I'm like, cool. My conclusion from all of this is things are totally fine. Yeah. I enjoy making videos. I can just keep making videos. Yeah. And just that's, that's I, it. <laughs> like, I, that's all I, have to I would share some advice for, you know, young creators of like, the, the, the way to experience some of that is, uh, or, or what we're talking about of like re relinquishing some fear. Like I think fear, a lot of fear comes from um, maybe building too fast. Hmm. You know, like let's say you have a great Q4 yeah. and you're like, oh my, ad rates are up. The channel's exploding. This is amazing. We should hire three more people. We should sign a one-year <laughs> lease on a, uh, on a really expensive studio. We should, you know, invest in all these different things. Um, being a, uh, a creative and being in a creative business, you have to expect some level of volatility and not just volatility in the market. You have to expect emotional volatility. Mm. And I think emotional yeah. volatility of like, I'm in love with this process of making videos right now. It's so fun. Could there be a more fun job paired with, I hate this. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I don't want to make a video today. I'm not feeling up to it. I want to make one video this month instead of four. That level of emotional volatility or just you know, you have to leave space for that. Yeah. And if you tie your creativity to too much overhead, now you're afraid. Yeah. Now you're like, now I can't pay people. Now yeah. people depend on me. That's now terrifying, I'm, yeah. now mm -hmm. I'm going to disappoint people. Yeah. That's terrifying, right? That's that's when fear really starts to build up. When mm. you're like, I can't pay my rent. I can't, oh my God, I'm not going to make any money because to run my business costs so much money. So yeah, sure, we're making a million dollars, but I'm spending 990, you know, like mm -hmm. that's, yeah. That's when you're in a scary place, right? Yeah. And if um, you have two people running the company, expect two times the emotional volatility. <laughs> what is that dynamic like? Because it's it's unusual to have co-founders like a duo in the creator economy. I suppose there's a uh, Rhett and Link. Um, there's Rhett and Link, uh, but most of them are couples. Yeah, like uh, Matt and Abby. Yeah, Carl and Nate. Most of yeah. them are dating. Oh, I love yeah. the couple. Yeah, yeah, and but, which so, is why for, people. For the record, like we are a couple. Yeah. You know, no, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, <laughs> no. because that is the most searched it's the most searched question uh, question about Colin and Samir or Colin and Samir dating uh, I we, think people just see us in a frame and they assume we like sleep in bunk beds yeah, in the same like, room and like how, adult bed in the same yeah, room. Yeah. How, how could we not be in this box yeah. together yeah. Um, but no I have a wife and Colin has a fiance so unfortunately uh, to, to, to quell those rumors we are not oh, dating damn. Um, but you know that said it's not different from a, a marriage you know I'm married and it's it's not uh, there's some things that are different, but it's not, uh, you know, there's emotional similarities to it of having a partner, uh, attaching your, your, yourself to someone, your ability to earn is attached to someone, your ability to express is attached to someone, uh, your bank account is attached to someone. Like there's so much that's attached, mm -hmm. right? Our, our context to other people. I'm Samir from Colin and Samir, mm -hmm. right? You know, that, that's, that's also our Yeah. Context. I was surprised when I first heard your surname. I was like, oh. Yeah, I guess you've got a surname. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. so many people call me Colin, which is so funny because they like they look at me and they're like, Colin and Samir. Yeah. You know, like his first name <laughs> yeah. is Colin. Yeah, they see uh, Samir first. Like, yeah. oh, Colin. Yeah. Oh, wait, like, wait no. what? What? Yeah, so we, we are like, to package yourselves uh, is is a very, you know, 
it's 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 not an easy thing to do. And I I would say that it's um I saw this, we both saw this on Twitter, but someone said uh if if you don't want to split the company evenly with your co-founder or co-founders, you should not be co-founders. Mm. If you don't believe that you are providing equal value, yep. you should not enter into that business together. And um I think that's a really important thing, you know, and you have to believe that wholeheartedly and hold on to that belief for the entirety of the project. Um, you know, is like we are equals in this yeah. project. We support each other. Without either of us, it doesn't exist. Um, that's a super important thing. Um, I think value alignment is more important than creative alignment of mm -hmm. what do we value about life? What do we care about when it comes to life? Mm. Because we will spend the majority of our life together. Mm. Right, like you spend more time together than you do with your respective partners. At times, yeah, yeah at times. for sure. I mean, on a day to day, yeah, we're together for eight to ten hours during yeah. the day. Um, that's really significant, you know. So, yeah, there's a lot of complex dynamics to it. I don't know much of a life without it because we've been mm, doing, we've been really... creating together for twelve years. Oh, that's a wholesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is wholesome. It's nice. probably why people think we're dating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, even for us, it's strange, or at least surprising. But no one thinks Rhett and Link are dating. Yeah, we don't know that. Yeah, actually, I guess we don't know that. Yeah. I guess, I've, I've yeah. never once thought that they were dating, yeah. but I did, I did think of that about you guys for some yeah. reason. I guess because you're, you're younger, so like... Maybe. We're yeah. younger. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. We're just more stylish than them. That's yeah, probably that's it. But you don't want to go on record. No, I don't, saying I don't that. want to go on record. I think they have stylists. If, if and I, they're more stylish. If I can just for a quick styles, second I would say like to redact everything, yeah. Samir just just said for a quick second, if I can say how jealous I am of how stylish I think Rhett and Link are, every time I see them, I'm just like they look dynamite. So yes. okay, go. What, what were you saying, Colin? Now I'm just thinking about Rhett and Link and their style. Yeah, <laughs> fashionable they are. The, there's only two occasions where I've seen Rhett and Link. The first one is in their YouTube ad for Wix before I had YouTube Premium. Mm. We're Rhett and Link, and we made our website with Wix. Yeah. And the second one was their interview with you. Yeah. Like I did not really know anything. I, th I think they're very US centric. Yeah, they're uh, like yeah, I've yeah, never heard of them. Very US. Yeah. For outside sure. of that Wix ad, and then you're yeah, you saw like, them on our channel, and you're like, are those the guys from the Wix? Yeah, that's those are the guys from the Wix. I was like, whoa, these guys are huge. They've got a whole like, whoa. And I was finding out about them for the first time in your interview with them, and I was like, damn, this is this is a good setup. Did we? Answer your question. What was your question? Um, what's it like being co-founders? Oh yeah. yeah. What's it like, Cole? Yeah, I don't know anything else. It's uh, it's a lot of what you said. You don't you don't make a hundred percent of the decisions that you would make. You don't spend time a hundred percent of the way you would make it. You don't get a hundred percent of your identity in public. You're sharing a lot yeah. of it, and uh, it takes a lot of compromise, a lot of uh, communication, and a lot of belief that the time spent together is uh, worth it, is enjoyable, and is producing now the life that, that you yeah. actually want. Yeah, there's all, you know, as a bit, as in a business, you know, it costs a lot of money to run our business mm -hmm. right now because, you know, we, we've gotten a bigger studio. Again, we're investing a lot into the business right now. Um, but whatever my financial ambition is, I have to double it for yeah. us, right, as a company. And um, that's our reality, right? And I think you, you have to, that is hard. And so you have to um, look at the cost benefit and be like, but the benefit of this so heavily outweighs, you know, that cost that of course I'll do it. Mm -hmm. And it's not even a question. There's not even that evaluation. It's just like, this is the only way I could be doing this thing I'm doing right now, which I am enjoying doing. Mm -hmm. And I also... You know, there's a moment where we crossed a million subscribers while giving a speech at VidSummit, yeah. which was not planned and a very intense emotional experience. Oh. Um, and sharing that moment with someone is what to me is powerful about this whole journey yeah. is that Colin and I can always look at each other and go, dude, can you believe this? Mm -hmm. We did it or we're doing it yeah. or we just did that. Isn't yeah. that crazy? And like, I can say that to Colin and he can say back to me, yep. yeah, man, mm -hmm. it is crazy. And like, you know, I can say that to my wife or to my brother yeah. and my dad, my mom, and they can kind of be like, yeah, yeah, it seems, it's really yeah. impressive what you're doing. That's so cool. It's like, do you want to go on a roller coaster by yourself or you want to go on it with <laughs> yeah. someone that, yeah. that you enjoy who can affirm to you that it was scary, it yeah. was fun, it was everything that yeah. you also thought in your head that yeah. it was. Yeah. And so I think that that is like, 
you know, that, that to me is like, I think life is meant to be shared. I think creative projects are more fun when they're collaborative. Like I just have a belief system that this is a collaborative thing to do. Yeah. Um, it's more fun to collaborate. And so if we're looking at fun as a metric, which it should be for everyone in a creative business, uh, then this is more fun. Would either of you ever start a couples channel with your respective wives slash fiancés? Absolutely no, not. Not no, no shot. Yeah. I am. I have why, why just not? the amount of exposure <laughs> yeah. that I want. Yeah. Okay. To my personality, to everything, to thinking about a brand. Yeah. I find it incredibly difficult. I haven't posted on Instagram in over two years mm. because I can't do it and do it just objectively. What do you mean? Like I can't do it. I, I have to ask, why am I posting that? Yeah. Who's the audience for this? Yeah. With what reason? <laughs> what brand know, is going to sponsor this post? I know that won't perform yeah. because I understand some of these platforms. Yeah. And it's just, I, like, I need to just focus on the YouTube channel, the business that we're building. I yeah. can't spend mental energy, yeah. let alone on another like couple's endeavor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would be far too much. Okay. I, 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 I enjoy like posting about uh, personal stuff I occasionally post on Instagram and when I feel like it I enjoy it um but yeah I I am this to me like in terms of amount of recognition we have I, I feel very fulfilled in it I feel uh like I have enough I don't I don't crave uh fame you know beyond the the recognition we have right now yeah. so when I think about that and I definitely don't crave it in the context of my relationship what I crave in the context of my relationship is quality time. Mm -hmm. And that to me does not include a camera. So, yeah. you know, that changes the dynamic. It's a it's another person in the room. It's another, you're, you're, you are, it's completely different. Yeah. Um, and I think like life is very fun, like traveling with my wife and, you know, we just went to Italy and just had a great time and we walked to coffee shops in the morning. Like I don't want, sometimes we, we go to coffee shops or we go to uh, dinner and, you know, people sometimes more than others, people come up and, you know, want to talk or take pictures. And, um, that's like, so incredibly like to me, I'm still like, that's insane that mm. people would want to come up and, and chat. Yeah. Luckily our fans and the people who watch our show are like professionals, yeah. you know? And so they come up and they're so respectful and you get to have like a really cool conversation, but I wouldn't want that in the context of my relationship, you know, hmm. of people looking at my relationship and, and being fans of my relationship. Like I, that mm -hmm. to me is, there's nothing about that that sounds interesting or attractive. I, my answer might have been different in my early twenties mm. when I, go. when I really craved fame. Uh, but I think that's wrapped up in a lot of different things. And I, I don't, mm. I don't have that feeling at all anymore. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I love uh, being on this side of the mic and looking at you and being like, where is he about to take that? Yeah, I Did no I just idea. drop something that he is no, now okay. changing so his trajectory? I, so I've been, I've been intrigued by the idea of like the couple's channel as a phenomenon for a oh, while. Oh, so you want to do it? I th I'm not sure. This, oh, is, this wow. is the thing I'm trying, I'm trying to figure this. out. Yeah, oh, this is what I'm trying man, to figure out yeah. because, you know, I've, I've got a podcast that I occasionally do with my brother. We've been doing it since 2019. Initially, it was very consistent, now less so. But it's nice because we just rock up. What's the, what's the podcast it's called? It's called uh, Not Overthinking. Oh, Not Overthinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, yeah. it's kind of nice. Yeah. Good memories, good vibes. Get to chat to my brother kind of thing. And it's a fun little joint project that we do together. At one point, we had episodes sponsored, and we hated that because it put a requirement on it, and we got rid of the sponsors. And yeah. now it's purely a passion project. Yes. And so my idea for a couple's channel is like, well, Let's say I were to start a couple's channel with someone else and it was purely a hobby. Like we would never, it's no, there's never an upload schedule. It's just like, we talk about relationship stuff occasionally. We like reading relationship books and it's like, here's what we learned. C could be kind of helpful. Uh, maybe a brand might sponsor us to go stay in a nice resort for a week or some something like that. I have this sort of like somewhat idealistic, like, oh, it, it would be fun to do this joint project with someone else. Um, but then I think about it and I think about like, do I need the fame? No. Do I need the money? No. Like, would I be trying to make it a commercial asset? No. Do I, I, I can just go on the holiday to the resort anyway, like, yeah. regardless of whether it's free or not. Do you want to like, go to the resort and do a deliverable with yeah, your girlfriend? Yeah, like, no. Probably, probably right. not. Probably so, not. Right? Or you be recognized as yeah. the couple that understands how to be a couple. Like, if you're yeah. trying things, yeah. you know, you're reading books and you're talking about it, the yeah. perception may be that you have it all figured out. Yeah, or that we're learning learning along the way. Um, and even yeah, if you are actually learning yeah. along the way. You know, I, I would the say... The perception may not be that. Yeah. My advice for you would be, if you crave it, to do it without distributing it. For oh, a while. interesting, yeah. 
like make videos yeah. with your significant other yeah. and just watch them back yourself with her. Yeah. Maybe show a friend or family. Like I think mm. we have lost the art of uh, experimenting and practicing in private. Mm. We think yeah. everything needs to be an exp a public experiment. Yeah, and public experiments uh, come with a lot of just complications. They yeah. come with, especially as you are a you know recognized brand in the space. Mm. Whatever you do, people are going to talk about me like. Ali Abdal launches, you know, X channel. Mm. Uh, why did he do that? Let's break it down. Yeah. Seven reasons why Ali <laughs> yeah. Abdal did, you know, I'm like, yeah. that's going to color some of your thinking. Um, the strategy of it's going to color some of your thinking. Like, yeah. I think you can do it in private. Mm. You know, when I really, I, we had this conversation the other day, we talk about the start of the Colin and Samir channel as, you know, September, 2016. We never talk about the start of the Colin and Samir podcast, which is essentially what has become our entire career, which mm. was in 2018 when we were really down and out, having an existential crisis because we couldn't make any money as creatives and decided as almost an act of therapy to get on mics to have open conversations with each other. Yeah. Because it created a container where we sat and looked at each other and talked about how we felt about what was going on mm. for an hour or two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the most therapeutic things that we could have done yeah. was decide that we would just grab mics and talk to each other. Mm. And that, when I think about it, is like something I'd like to do with my dad. I'd mm -hmm. like to create that container with my dad. I'd like to do that with my wife. Do I need to distribute it? No. Mm. I could just record it. But I, what I actually want is the container. Yeah. I want that space. Yeah. Yeah. I keep thinking about home movies, the mm. fact that I actually do have, from my younger years, home movies shot by my mom or my dad yeah. that were just sitting on tapes in my house. Yeah. And of course, when they filmed them, it was just to hold on to these memories. Yeah. And even as I travel with my fiance next week, or I think about like having kids, I don't want to not have home movies mm -hmm. and home video. Yeah. I just may not want to put them out in public. Yeah, yeah. And I think we started the podcast that way. Yeah. yeah. In a way, it was like, let's just record this because it's something we're going through. It's something we want to do. It was like putting it on a shelf. Not that many mm -hmm. people were listening to it back then. Uh, but now I'm so happy that we did that and we have those those memories and, and that understanding of what it was like. There's an episode that I will cherish forever, which is uh, the most Hollywood thing we've ever done. It was at a time where we decided, you know, okay, none of this is working, but our dream is to, we were making some branded documentaries and like our background, that's what we we're passionate about. That's what brought us together was our love of documentary storytelling. And so- um, we had made some successful documentaries in the more like branded world. We never made like an entertainment documentary. Yeah. And during the Quibi era, I don't know if you remember this. No. Ah, wow, Quibi was not a thing here. Yeah. The Quibi. Americans listening who are in the entertainment business remember <laughs> Quibi. Okay. It was essentially a wildly well-funded distribution platform that was looking for content. Okay. Through a, a series of crazy events, Colin and I got the opportunity to um, create a sizzle reel and pitch a show with a, with a creative partner who was – uh, named Tom Boyd, who's an awesome creator, who had filmed essentially home videos in Atlanta, living in a house with Justin Bieber and an artist named Asher Roth. And they had worked together. Um, Asher Roth was like signed by Scooter Braun, who's Justin Bieber's manager, and uh, had, you know, was an emerging artist in Atlanta. Scooter found Justin, moved him into the house too, and they all lived together. And Tom was there as like a creative partner and was filming all of it. Scooter kind of suggested to him, maybe we'll make like an MTV show about this music house. So Tom filmed all of it. And he called us and was like, hey, I, I found all this footage of like these early days with Justin Bieber and um, this song that we wrote that essentially saved Scooter's company that then financed Justin Bieber's career. Like there's this crazy story about this time. And we we're like, okay, cool. We'd love to make a doc. We're looking to make a doc. This sounds like a really good doc. Yeah. And we basically got the ex the opportunity to create a pitch, create a sizzle reel, and go pitch this to Scooter Braun. And when we went there, uh, to our surprise, as we're pitching the show, Justin Bieber walks in the room, and oh. there's four of us. One of them is Justin Bieber. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just a crazy experience. The most LA kind of Hollywood, trying to make it as filmmakers experience. Mm -hmm. Within half an hour of ending that meeting, we oh, we got mics and just told the story back so we yeah. wouldn't forget every detail. Yeah. And we mm -hmm. put it up on our podcast feed. Again, no one listened to it, yeah. but it was just like, 
now I sometimes go back and listen to that episode because it was so funny and fun and we were laughing and it was mm -hmm. like, what a crazy experience we had. Nothing happened with that pitch. It did not pan out. Mm. But that memory being captured with no commercial intent is so pure to me. Mm. And it's so great to go back and be like, that was a time in my 20s when I was trying different things. Mm -hmm. And Colin and I would stay up all night making these sizzle reels and pitches and be like, maybe this is the project that'll make our career, you know? And just having these crazy experiences. Mm. And that's what I think maybe we crave and we we mix that up with the desire, with, with maybe justifying it through commercial intent. Mm. You know, you're like, well, if I'm gonna film me and my girlfriend, I should probably monetize it, right? Because I know how to monetize video. Mm. And I don't think you need to do that. Yeah. That's a yeah, it's a it's a, a thought process that that goes through my head annoyingly often when mm. whenever I do like I was playing Diablo 4 the other day and I was thinking oh it's such a waste of time doing this and not streaming it like, <sighs> I oh, should stream God. this on Twitch <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. Was, like Twitch is dying like YouTube game oh I guess okay cool I guess I should stream it on the main channel or on the yeah. second channel and then I guess oh, you know might as well restream IO to like all the other platforms <laughs> mm -hmm. and I, I suppose I can answer questions from the audience while it's happening yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose we can record that chop it up into so uh, I just said, fuck it. I, I'm just going to sit here and play Diablo 4 for a little yeah, bit. It's, yeah. it's okay. It's all good. That, that like <laughs> confusion around like, should this be productive is something I've wrestled with yeah. my entire life and still wrestle with. Mm. Uh, if I sit on the couch, I'm like, sitting on the couch. <laughs> what, what could I be doing while sitting on the couch? Okay, I'll text people. I'll text, you know, uh, people about ideas. I'll get feedback on ideas. Or maybe I'll call my mom. Maybe I'll, it's like, Sitting in stillness is one of the most challenging things to do or just even enjoying something for a moment. Like, I'll just yeah. read this book. Oh, but this book, maybe by reading this book, I'll know how to write a book. Okay, that's good. Mm. That'll justify it. <laughs> yeah, I found, that, I found that for me over, over time, it's, it's, it's kind of annoying in a way, but I've, I've been increasingly reading fewer and fewer books each year because before, any downtime would be spent listening to something on Audible at 3x speed. And then I'd be making videos about how I read 100 books Dude, a year. Th hold on, can we just pause on that? Yeah. 3x speed. I mean, it depends on the narrator, but sometimes 2.5, sometimes 3. If but, it's a really dense dude, book, 1.5. That is yeah. wild. I am like 1.25 is my max. Oh, you can slowly work it up over time if you really want to. <laughs> but 3x is insane. I mean, for for most like nonfiction books, if you self help books, if you understand the vibe, you can you can kind of get through the message. But <laughs> I used to do that quite a lot, and then that would lead to these great videos where it's like how you know how I read how I read 100 books a year kind of thing. It's not that hard if you listen to an audiobook every three days at 3x yeah, speed. Yeah, if you bump but, that up to 100x, you could probably yeah, you read, just like yeah, you could probably read a million books. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All that catalog. Um, but now increasingly, like even when I'm driving, I'll often just think, you know what? We just like not listen to anything. I'll go for a walk in Hyde Park and not listen to anything like actively. Yeah. And it's I've, hard. I, it's, it's hard. But I think over time, I'm becoming more and more comfortable with it. Which then also means I'm like, oh man, I used to be the hundred books a year guy, and now I read like twenty five this year. Oh wow, mm. what a waste man. You know that kind of thing. <laughs> you know what I've found to be the most helpful uh, activity if you want to start to practice not being stimulated by audio or video, and that sounds like crazy even when I say it, but swimming. Mm. Uh, yeah. I started swimming, and you're underwater in this flow state just with your thoughts. Yeah. And like the first few lengths, it's kind of like you're focused on the swimming. And then after a while, it goes like, huh, I'm just here underwater with no inputs. Yeah. I can't speak. I can't listen to anything. Mm. I'm just here. Yeah. That to me is like the most present. Mm. It's that and playing paddle tennis. Oh, yeah. Because when you're that. playing paddle tennis, if you lose focus on the ball, you're like, you're going to lose the point or you're not going to hit the ball. Yeah. You have to like focus on this green ball. It's like very nice to just be like, I'm present, I'm focused. Yeah. It's funny. I think the value of there being two of us is that I'm not like that. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah you know, yeah. that you I like can, that? I mean, yeah. I can, I always, since I've been a student, I can sit and focus on one thing for hours or I can go to the beach, not listen to music, not do anything and sit for an hour. I just like have that ability, I think, to like, yeah. Like have a baseline that's a little bit Zen vibes. <laughs> and maybe that's because I'm not like a son of immigrants yeah, and like yeah, I was not raised sure. in a in that type of, you know of environment. Uh, but I think it's it is like a very like different thing about the two of us. It's also the re yeah again back to the question about co-founders. It's that's why it works, right? Like I, I said this uh, the other day on a pod but that we were talking. But I, I said like my job is to create the canvas. Colin's job is to paint on it. Mm. That is how we operate. Okay. Um, I bust the door into a room and say, mm -hmm. we can do this. And then I actually don't know how we're going to do it. And then Colin 
walks into the room and does it. Yeah. Right. Like, and helps us do it. Like yeah. that is, that has been our relationship for 12 years. Not that we don't flow over to, you know, the other side yeah. to help, yeah. but that, that has really been the relationship. Even us being here in London right now, I was not going to be the one to say like, to push and to buy the ticket and be like, yes, we're going to London. We're going to interview all these people. Yeah. But then once the decision is made, we can craft it, mm -hmm. sink into it creatively, yeah. turn it into what we want it to be. Yeah. So that that is also like again like the 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 exploration of like value in partnership is like you know you have to look at the other person and be like I I I like deeply respect empathize understand and value your contribution to this in a way that's like uh I don't know how to explain it but in a way that's like it would never even come into question like it just it's not even something. And I, I would say that's that differs from other partnerships that I've been in where you kind of go to bed and you're questioning the value that each person is contributing or you're questioning like, hmm, is this split right? Am yeah. I getting compensated enough for this? Is this – like if you're entering into doing a creative project with someone like the way we do it, you that – I wouldn't do it if that ever – that question ever arises mm. in your head. Hmm. I also want to add one thing to you playing Diablo Four <laughs> and yeah. feeling guilty about it. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh no. So I was I was playing it while on my walking treadmill, so I got the steps in. Okay. So there like, you go. Yeah, there you go. So you figured that <laughs> out. There it is. Yeah. So I tried also playing it, listening to listening to an audiobook, and I was like, no, that's too much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just so those two things. <laughs> there was a moment a few years back when I kind of had a similar feeling watching shows on like Netflix and whatnot, yeah. documentaries and things like that and feeling like, am I spending a lot of my time consuming yeah. here and not really creating? Yeah. And a really good friend of ours who was a professional lacrosse player that we met during our time there still, you know, was a groomsman in Samir's wedding, Paul Rabel, uh, that we've done a lot of projects with said to me, he was like, no, that's part of your job. You're heavily on the creative side of this business. You need to be watching studying, relaxing at times, taking in these inputs that are a bit unexpected. Mm. Like you need to be exposed to all these things. So if you're staying up late and you feel guilty watching something or staying up late, waking up late the next day, that's okay. Don't, don't be so hard on yourself because try and think about where that actually fits into your creative process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not necessarily your, the productivity side of your brain or the productive process. There's a, um, a, a little bit different uh, on the concept of rest. Um, there is a Tim Ferriss podcast with Jerry Colonna. Hmm. I cannot recommend it enough. It's about um, rest, breaks, and doing different things and the value of that in your entrepreneurship. Okay. Yeah. I just I have to recommend it. I think it, it redefined my relationship with rest. Sick. Yeah. I will check it out. You guys both at various points use the phrase, uh, finding a format you see you found the format mm. which you now have what do you mean finding the format a format is the most powerful thing in media period like finding a format is the whole thing in my opinion you look at some of the most popular shows hot ones hot ones is a format right sean evans sits across he can explain the format really well right okay i'm going to interview someone and we're going to eat progressively hotter and hotter wings right Questions are hot, the wings are hotter, or something like that, whatever the, the tagline is. Uh, Amelia de Moldenberg, not to stay in the chicken space, but chicken shop date, right? And when you find a format, you can get better at that format. You can collaborate within that format. You can build a team around that format. You can build a brand around a format, right? Formats are the key that unlocks mm -hmm. success in media. Um, it allows for that consistency that we were talking about earlier, that's really difficult for creatives to find. Yeah. But if you can find a format, again, you know how long it takes, you know how much it costs, right? Let, let's look at- How many you can make. Let's look at other examples. Uh, Ryan Trahan, the Penny series, that is a format. I am going to start with a penny. I can only you know get things through this penny and I'm going to achieve this goal at the end of it. That is a format. Let's look at Mr. Beast. Um, one dollar thing versus really expensive thing. That is a format, right? He is replicating a format and getting better at a format. So, mm. you know, largely I think it, it, if you want to make it as a creator, um, there is a, you know, there is an unlock, which is finding your format, mm. finding that thing that you like to make yeah. 
yeah. that the audience wants and that the platform likes. And and again, within that format, you can also figure out how does a sponsor fit into this format? Where does the sponsor fit in? Does the sponsor fit in? Yep. Right? And so all of a sudden you have a product. The product is the format. And so if if we are looking at media as a business, then that is what you're building. The most successful formats in the world, you know, if you zoom out, American Idol, that is a format, right? That yeah. can be scaled, replicated, yeah. built upon. There can be an audience for that format. So like that is that that is, I think, um, what you're looking for uh when it comes to building a career on the internet uh, as an online creator, looking for a format. And for us specifically, we were doing vlogs, we were doing video essays. And then finally, when we turned the podcast into video form, that's the unlock for us. Mm. That's what worked. That's yeah. what we could handle. That's what we could build a process around. We could hire for. We could get out on a consistent basis. We could get better at doing it. Yeah. Yeah. That makes so much sense. <laughs> I feel like so much stuff has just sort of clicked in place in my mind. And I've never really had the terminology to describe it. But I guess like with my channel, I've been experimenting a little bit with formats over the years. At one point, there was I started off with vlogs as the format, then moved to talking head videos that are educational in five to 15 minutes, and then experimented with more like voiceover vlog as the format, experimented with like long form study with me video as the format, experimented with like me giving advice while walking around, experimented with like Matt Diavella documentary style format. Hmm. But really, what it always comes down to is me talking to a camera 15 minutes and having random shit come up on the screen occasionally. Like, <laughs> that's the format. Yeah. Yeah. And I keep on thinking, I keep on getting format well, FOMO. Like Johnny Harris. Yeah. Yeah. Johnny Harris's yeah, format yeah, gets yeah. him 5 million views a video. Like, oh shit. Like, why don't I do videos like that? Format FOMO is <laughs> such a good <laughs> term. I like that term. Yeah. I've never heard that before. Format. And like, what? Uh, format FOMO. What the guys at Charisma on Command do with like breakdowns. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, like, what if I could do a breakdown of Elon Musk's FOMO. productivity? To, uh, it's, it's such a good term. Format yeah, FOMO. I feel that's that so real. Yeah. Yeah. But um, again, we're not consistent people or creative yeah, people. Yeah. So that's why you have the FOMO. You're like, yeah. I'd like to do that over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, um, I would say the, like, the Ali Abdal format, one of the greatest things is I can close my eyes and envision it, right? That's a brand. A brand is consistent. A brand is something that can be talked about. I can say, oh yeah, Ali Abdal, he's a, he's a creator that does these list videos about productivity, about evidence-based studies, you know, like I can I can talk about your brand because you have a format. Um, if mm. we did a different video every single time, sure, there might be people who are like, I like these guys, Colin and Samir. They make uh, creative videos. Yeah, <laughs> that's hard to to build. And again, it's this is all coming from a place of like us articulating what it has taken to turn this into uh, a commercially successful entity, mm. not what it has taken to be creatively fulfilled. That is a different thing. Sure. Um, so like I, finding a format in media is the biggest unlock from a commercial perspective. Um, that's, that's the thing that can take you. Hmm. Do you guys get format FOMO these days? All the time. Yeah, of course. Oh, what is it? How, Every it like time you? I watch YouTube, Netflix, Instagram <laughs> at all times, I think that'd be probably fun to make. I that. have format FOMO with you personally. Mm. Yeah. With your videos. I, I've, I think I've always wanted to have that avenue of like looking into a camera and, and articulating ideas and, and, um, things that I've learned. I've just always wanted that. Um, and I've never pursued it. So mm -hmm. like I have format FOMO with that. Yeah. I think we collectively have format FOMO with documentary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Johnny Harris yeah. with the breakdown video essay, definitely have format FOMO with that. <laughs> I, I think our interview show came from me having format FOMO, uh, of, podcast. I, mm. I spent a lot of my 20s listening to Tim Ferriss, listening to how I built this yep. as Dax Shepard came about, listening to Dax talk to actors. like, And that was like, hmm, I would love to do that. You mm. know, that's that for me is where the, the interview show came from. I was like, that's cool. No one's doing that in the world that I really care about, that I think is actually the future of entertainment and entrepreneurship. So let's try that. To what extent should should you experiment with formats, even once you've found your format that works? I think everything's, like, you should always be experimenting as a creative. I think the thing about even our podcast is what happened was we were, we were making these, like, explainer videos on our channel. People who have been watching for a while know we found a format that was working, which was Colin and I sit in the car and break down, you know, something about YouTube. Yeah. 
And that was a great format. It was fun. It got way too hot in the car because for some reason we wouldn't let ourselves turn on the AC. We thought it would mess <laughs> mm-hmm. up the sound. So we would just sweat profusely in the car. <laughs> it took a lot of writing and a lot of research and a lot of creativity that you know was, was intense. The post-production really sat on Colin's shoulders, which was a lot of work and a lot of effort. Um, and it was hard for us to be consistent within that format. So when we wanted to experiment with a podcast, we started a podcast YouTube channel. Mm. And we started uploading the Colin and Samir podcast to that YouTube channel. Oh, yeah. The Colin mm-hmm. and Samir show. Yeah. Was it? yeah. Well, it was called or the Colin and Samir podcast. podcast. Yeah. 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 And we interviewed, we gave, we did Eric's first interview on that channel. We yeah. did an interview with Graham Stephan. We talked to each other on that channel. We probably did 20 episodes mm. over there. And then what we realized was, okay, these car videos are working and they're good and people like them, but we can only really make like one a month or one every six weeks. The podcast, while we've been doing that, we've made once a week. So that's the format because we Mm -hmm. can do that. So now we're ready. Let's bring that to the main channel. And the views were comparable. Yeah, and then on some other ones they were exceeding what they we were, were explosive, doing. Explosive, yeah. On the breakdown, so it was just so you like, find a format that you can be. It's easier to do. It's more consistent. Yeah, you enjoy it. Yeah, mm-hmm. it requires less post production. Great. Yeah, <laughs> and so it, now that, yeah. that's become our engine, yeah. right? Like that's the basis of what we do. It's the basis of the business. Yeah. But because we have an engine, mm-hmm. we now have allowed ourselves space to experiment a little bit more nice. freely. Yeah. So I'd say don't experiment without an engine. Hmm. And don't experiment in the engine. Yeah, <laughs> you know, if you don't, if you don't have to, you should always be trying to get better and and, and sure. experiment within the mm-hmm. confines of like, you know, how to exp- how to make the engine better. Yeah. Um, but we also changed the name from the Colin and Smear podcast to the Colin and Smear Show, mm-hmm. and that was really intentional because as we brought it to YouTube, we started thinking about what we were doing in the car could also kind of be done in this new show format yeah. where maybe sometimes there would be a guest, maybe sometimes it would just be me and Colin, maybe yeah. sometimes we would do it a little different. And so to allow for that variance, we called it the Colin and Samir show. Mm. That was intentional to say there might be a level of variation here. It might not always feel like a podcast. Mm. So let's call it a show. And that that was the decision to change from Colin and Samir podcast to Colin and Samir show. And then there was still a lot of experimentation. And I would probably say a lot of identity, like complications within identity of here's two guys who you know, and I'll let Colin speak more to this, but like who set out to become documentary filmmakers and now we have a talk show. Was this what we wanted? Yeah. I mean, I was accustomed to feeling a sense of self worth from editing, storytelling, Mm -hmm. even holding a camera. So to then forego that for an unedited hour plus conversation where conversation was what was valued it was really difficult for me to be like oh i have to just i'm going to shed the part of my identity that gives me what i think like validation from myself that was kind of scary um and i think i've kind of fought it over the last two years of taking conversations and hyper editing them when we first started yeah they were very hyper edited at the start. They're hyper edited. <laughs> I, w- I was feeling so much FOMO of that format. I was like, "Oh man, we should totally like do a podcast where we hyper edit everything." No, you should. <laughs> it's it, well, it's, if you want to do it, sure. Yeah, if you yeah, want to, if you want to, but yeah, the format that uh, and it was really interesting because this was a moment of like you know creative collaboration that I you know I could feel was uh, like I was a consumer of long form podcasts. Colin was, but not re- not as much. Definitely not in video form. Yeah. And so like I was a consumer of this format. I, I had format FOMO of this format. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I was really happy when we found a talk show format. Yeah. I was like, this is what I want to do. I could see myself doing this for a very long time. Yeah. You know, and still to this day, I'm like, I, I, I have pinch me moments when we do the interviews. Like sitting across from Tim Ferriss was crazy. Sitting mm-hmm. across from mm-hmm. Dream was like, I love this. This is amazing. Like we get to have long conversations with people that inspire me uh, and that I'm curious about. That to me seems still like insane uh, that that is our job now. <laughs> you know, like we mm-hmm. have to fly to London to have conversations. <laughs> yeah. I think I've said it every day we've been here. Yeah. I'm like, this is crazy. Is this going to, we yeah. can do this? <laughs> yeah. We can just, is it the job? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's amazing. Uh, it's, it's incredible. But it took a long time to accept 
I would say, between our our collaboration to say, we are podcasters, we are talk show hosts. Yeah. That is what we yeah. do. That took that took time to reestablish this identity. And it doesn't mean that's all we are. That is the format, that is the engine of the business. La- at the end of last year, we got to experiment with a documentary. We got to spend 24 hours with Mr. Beast as he opened his first physical restaurant. That was awesome. That was just me and Colin holding cameras. And then we got to collaborate um, with one of our editors, Chris, who really helped us while we continued to push the engine forward, you know, essentially create this story that we were Mm -hmm. really proud of and create this documentary that was the type of documentary that we wanted to make. Mm -hmm. And so the engine is what unlocked the rest of the world to us, the, the dream, which was, let's make this documentary. And for me, I didn't feel like I was missing out on anything. Like I look back on that year and that one project was enough to feel proud of, to like scratch that creative itch, to experiment and do something different, to do something more filmmakery. And now I look at it as, oh my gosh, what a gift that we get to speak to people and have a podcast that's the engine that we then get to experiment. And I also think it is building the craft of documentary filmmaking in a way because we're sitting and learning how to ask questions, how to get to interesting conversations, Mm -hmm. and we're building trust with people. And if you really want to tell a good story, you need access. You need access, you need trust, you need to know how to tell an unscripted story, which is what we're doing right now. And it's (laughs) what you build when you sit with someone for two hours. You build that trust. That's really good. Oh, man. Finding the format. It's like experiment until you find the format. Once you find the format, you've unlocked your engine. Yes. And mm-hmm. now keep that engine running. Yes. Yeah. Don't like putting, screw the engine yeah, up yeah. because you're like chasing the, the shiny yeah, thing. Exactly. But you can experiment on the side with the shiny thing if you really want yeah, to. But yeah. like keep the engine going. Yeah. But also don't yeah. experiment too early because the engine will fall apart. Like yeah. Yeah. build the engine, make the engine yeah. strong. And like without an engine, you don't have a car. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Like, it's not taking you worry anywhere. about like <laughs> the color of the paint. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, podcasts. Loads of people get format FOMO about podcasts because mm-hmm. they're like, I can't believe you guys get to do this for a living where you sit down and talk to people. I want some of that. Um, to what extent would you guys recommend for someone who is completely new to the creator world starting a podcast as the the thing that they do? I think uh, having a podcast is one of the most rewarding things you can do. I would decouple it from the financial reward. Um, this was a conversation we have with Tim Ferriss. He talked about there is the... Uh, non-financial reward of having a podcast, which is the conversations and the experience of getting to have long conversations. Then there is the performance and financial reward. Those are two separate things. When you first start a podcast, you should not even think about the financial reward. One of the greatest things is that we didn't know that as we were starting a podcast from 2018 to 2021, really, that podcast existed as a fun thing that we got to do together. Mm. So the reward, if you really think about it, guys who are not really making a lot of money were spending time every week making a podcast, editing a podcast, because it was rewarding from a lifestyle perspective, from a fulfillment perspective, from just, I need to have this conversation. I need to have this format so that we can sit together and talk about the ups and downs of what we're going through. That was rewarding in itself. So I would, if you're going in as a creator saying, I want a podcast, Remove the monetization and just say, I'm going to do this because I want to do this, because it Mm -hmm. is rewarding for me to do this. Making a podcast is one of the least expensive things in the world, in the creative world, not in the world, but in the the creative (laughs) world. Um, It's not expensive. You know, we we had two mics laying around that were under $100. Um, We, you know, you could get a USB mic like you have right now that goes Mm -hmm. into your laptop. You, You can record a podcast on a very small budget. Um, and you can also edit a podcast quickly. You don't even have to edit it. You can upload it through anchor or megaphone or like any of these, there's, there's services that are free that you can use. Like it is a low cost, low friction thing. You shouldn't tie a ton of stuff to it. You should just have it be a thing that you enjoy doing. And if that turns into something amazing, but I don't think you even know if you like it until you do a hundred episodes, you know, maybe 50 episodes. I don't think you'll know anything about your own podcast until you do that. So leave enough space for it to end at episode 30. Yeah. And what do you think is the commercial viability of the podcast format these days for someone completely new to, new, completely new to it? Uh, that's hard. Yeah. 
I think, I think discovery it, it, is really hard. Yeah, discovery obviously is difficult, which is why a lot of people have taken to YouTube because you can use SEO and, and find audiences. I think when you find an audience, it can be one of the most impactful ways, obviously, to monetize because you're in people's ears for hours yeah. at a time. You know, I remember there was this time where we we built to the point where we had like 2,000 people listening to our podcast in probably 2019. Um, and that to me was like a lot, that was a lot of people. I think it was like between 1500 and 2000 people. And we did this podcast episode where, you know, we were experiencing a deep existential crisis. So I didn't know, we didn't know why we were doing what we were doing. We were very confused. So I stayed up at night one night and wrote these like 17 questions that we were going to independently answer that would help us kind of re-establish our why. Yeah. Why are we doing this? And so I sent it to Colin. We independently answered them. And then we came on a podcast and answered them. And it was really fun and mm -hmm. really nice. And at the end, I gave a URL to download it. At the end, the last minute. And it was a unique URL. And 750 people downloaded it in the first day. Wow. Out of 2,000 people. Yeah. And I was like... Like the list of questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. The PDF yeah. of questions. And I was like whoa, that is an incredibly engaged audience. And that's when I realized that having a podcast, having someone in between your ears for an hour or two hours every week is potentially, you have them in your ear more than you have your own parents, than you have your best friend, mm -hmm. than you have, they are they're occupying the space in between your ears. <laughs> mm -hmm. That is so incredibly deep, that yeah. connection. And so what I what what I would also suggest is like, yes, discovery is really hard. If you are like a brand new creator and you're mm -hmm. like, I'm gonna upload a podcast, that's gonna be really hard. If you have an audience, okay, that's you know, that's why a lot of YouTubers start a podcast. It's a simpler format. Um, they already have distribution, people are already interested in them. Okay, now they can have a podcast. But you also can figure out how to monetize with a smaller audience in podcast hmm. because you have such a deep connection with them. Okay. Is it going to be in sponsorship? That depends on your niche. That depends on your topic. Maybe you could get a title sponsor. You could figure something like that out. Um, but think about that premise of like, if you're selling people something, if you have a product that's truly valuable, that's connected to the content, they're probably the most engaged audience. Hmm. People who click on a podcast in an RSS feed are some of the most engaged. Yeah. I would say them and, and newsletter readers. Yeah, one thing that we, um, I, I was looking at our kind of internal company metrics and stuff the other day, and we track a bunch of things, and I was, I was looking for patterns, and I was looking at the podcast, and the podcast has about 20 times fewer subscribers, and like, similarly, 20 times fewer views yeah. than the main channel. But then I looked at the watch hours, yeah. and the watch hours for the podcast are like half of what the main channel is. Yeah, And so there is like a 10x difference between watch time on the main channel and watch time on the podcast given if we control for size mm -hmm. i was just like wow yeah mm -hmm. damn this podcast is actually like you need a very a, a, a way smaller podcast to have a huge impact on exactly. people because yeah. of the I long mean, formness about, of it like on our audio feed specifically uh we've like an 85 percent completion rate so you know even if you're sitting at thirty thousand people listening to an episode but 85% complete it? Yeah. It's like two at, hours of an <laughs> hour or two? Yeah. Whoa, right? Yeah. That's like, whoa. And they will click no matter what you put up. Not They aren't judging it based on a title and thumbnail. Yeah. They're like, I trust you. Mm -hmm. I trust you here, so I'm going to click. It's a permission-based environment, mm -hmm. which is very different from YouTube, which is an interruption-based environment, right? I have to create a thumbnail that interrupts you yep. in your feed enough that you stop and go, hmm. Okay, I'm going to click that. Yeah. And then you click it, and you, I still have to win yeah. the next 10 seconds. And then I still have to win the next 10 mm. seconds for you to buy in, right? But an audio experience is kind of like, look, it, it, what podcast do you listen to? Uh, Tim Ferriss, for Tim example. Ferriss. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if, t if Tim Ferriss has a new episode and you don't know who the guest is, how long will you give it? Oh, like half an hour, an hour. Half an yeah. hour. Yeah. That's, That's the same incredible. answer that I have. I will give yeah. it half an hour. Yeah. Who will give you half an hour on YouTube? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> They'll give you 10 seconds. Or even in real life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is what's so powerful about podcasting. Yeah. Um, Let yeah. alone, I think, the fact that the lack of video sometimes can be to your advantage. I think it's perhaps more engaging sometimes to just listen 
and fill in the gaps in your head of where they are and what they look like and mm. how they're feeling that day than to watch the video and get all those a- things answered for you. You're also the friend that keeps them company on their road trip or while they're doing laundry or you know while they're doing another task. So it's kind of like, it's like, do I want to drive alone or would I like to bring one of my best friends in the car? I'd rather bring my best friend in the car. And that's who you are to, to a lot of people, which is so interesting in podcasting. It's a completely different relationship. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do because it's very saturated. And and people only have a certain amount of time. And you're asking for an hour or two hours of yeah. their time. It's significant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, changing gears a little bit. You guys have a newsletter business as well mm-hmm. called The Publish Press. Yeah. Which was only when you guys were interviewing me in LA that I, I realized that, oh, that's a really clever name because it's like press publish, but like reversed. And yeah. also it's like, it's like, whoa, that's, that's really clever. And I can't, I can't believe I don't come across <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's the story behind the newsletter business and why did you decide to start a newsletter business? Yeah, so I, I think... Um, and what is a newsletter business? Just for <laughs> people who might not be familiar yeah. with uh, the published press. Yeah, I mean, uh, our business is uh, content and sponsorship. That's like to simplify it. We produce content and we get relevant sponsors to sponsor that content. That content happens in audio form, in video form, and now in written form. Um, that's like the simplest version of it, right? And you look at um, what the content stands for. Like what is the the, the product that we are creating? Um well, a lot of what we're doing is building a very hyper-specific audience that's interested in a certain topic, um, which is the creator economy and the business of creators. So as we started producing you know, the podcast uh, as a video podcast, we were still having hiccups in the process and figuring it out. But at maximum, we were like, we can make one of these a week. You know, that's, that's maximum for us is what it felt like. We can make one really good one a week. Um, and we were aware, we had a conversation with Alex Lieberman, who was the, one of the founders of Morning Brew. We had a nice call with him, talked, and I was like, I'm curious about newsletters because I think the audience that we are building spends time in their email inbox. Yeah. Like we're building a professional mm-hmm. audience. They care about this profession of being a creator. And a professional audience spends time listening to things mm-hmm. and reading things. Yeah. And we're making YouTube videos. So- that attracts kind of the aspirational creator. And we break our audience up into aspiring creator, career creator, and creator industry. Okay. The aspiring creator is, you know, the creator who knows how to make videos, has probably made some videos that have hit or, you know, trying to figure it out. And um, they hang out on YouTube. They get their education from YouTube, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the career creator is someone who is making an income and trying to figure out how to progress in their career, trying to learn from other career creators, trying to um, figure out how to make more money, trying to understand the career, looking for you know a sense of community, they're feeling isolated. Um, and then you go to the creator industry. Those are people who want to work with creators. They want to join the industry. They want to understand creators more. Each one of those um, categories of audience um, re- has different wants and needs and requires different things and also hangs out in different places. Yeah. As I mentioned, that visual to me is like a pyramid. The aspiring creator is the base of the pyramid. Um, they hang out on YouTube. That's, that's a big, big audience. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. That's a big audience. It's on YouTube. We're going to attract a ton of, of that audience and we need to provide them value, right? The career creator is also on YouTube, but they also open their email inbox, yeah. right? The uh, creator industry probably mostly opens their email inbox, yeah. right? So now where do we provide content yeah. in this pyramid? YouTube podcast inbox. So that's that's that was the thought, right? Is like where do we provide value? Where do we catch our audience where they already exist? Cuz our exercise and these are worksheets that are, you know, going to be in our course or that we've already built for our course. It's like how do you study where your audience is? Yeah. And that's what we realized. Audience is in the email inbox. So, we wanted to do it. We we met with Alex Lieberman and talked to him about it. Understood like, okay, this is Creating a good newsletter is similar to creating a good show, right? You have to get the right people involved. You have to uh, have people help you in in the way we wanted to do it. We wanted to do something similar to Morning Brew, which was, hey, can we tell three creator stories? And can we do that multiple times a week? Now we've gone from, okay, we tell one story in podcast form, but we could potentially tell six stories in written form a week, Mm -hmm. maybe nine. Could we do that? 
how can we do that? Mm -hmm. And so Alex introduced us uh, to someone who was leaving Morning Brew at the time named Josh Kaplan, uh, who came on as a consultant and helped us just figure out how to spin it up. How do we, how do we make a newsletter? Yeah. Who do we hire? Mm -hmm. What does it look like? And what we did was we, we brought on a writer and we ran it internally. We built it and ran it as an internal newsletter at our company to mm -hmm. say, what is this process like? Yeah. Is this good? Is this valuable? Yeah. Is this anything? You know, is this a thing we want to do? Yeah. So we did, I think maybe like two and a half, three months, we did it yeah, just it a internally. A little over two months. Yeah. I think what we realized too is that in our company Slack, we started to bring in more voices people who consume different parts of the creator economy than we do, people who focus on gaming or fashion. And realizing that within this Slack channel where everyone was sharing news that they were seeing throughout the day, that we were building something really valuable, mm -hmm. that if people could have access to essentially a curated version of this, yeah. that can kind of be the newsletter. Yeah. And I think we started to realize that in those two months of development by bringing in writers, adding them to the Slack channel. And that's where we were like, oh, that's where this value really is. We can only tell so many stories on our YouTube channel. We can only interview so many people because we primarily interview people whose content we watch or listen to, mm -hmm. and that's going to be capped. Yeah. And this was a way to see a much more holistic picture of what's happening yeah. with creators that we felt was valuable that we could distill to other people. We talk a lot about the term value prop extension. So you're like, what is your value prop as a creator? And what is an extension of that value prop? So, you know, for us, it was education, or it is mm -hmm. education, right? Education and curation, I would say. I would say education, curation, and articulation. We articulate what's mm -hmm. happening in this industry, yeah. right? So those, those three things are our value propositions. Um, education, okay, how can we extend that? Courses. We can make well-articulated, well-curated, online courses that you could buy. Okay, that's a direction for us. Um, education, curation, articulation. We can write about the greater economy. So that was the extension, right? And so mm -hmm. like those were the two things we really looked at. Yeah. Those are good extensions. We could do events, right? We could do events, that's yeah. that's pretty good. But that's, that's hard, we don't know how to do that. Yeah. Um, and so that's where we said, okay, there's some choices here. Merchandise is a choice, but is a t-shirt an extension of those th three things I just said? Not really, mm -hmm. right? It, it does represent community and identity, which is a part of our value proposition, but not, it's not what we lead with. Yeah. So that's where like newsletter made sense to us. Yeah. We can extend our value prop mm -hmm. through this newsletter. And that's why courses make sense to us. Those two things are extensions of our value propositions. Um, and so as we ran it internally for a while, then we said, okay, I think this is ready. Then we released it to a trusted group, mm -hmm. like a couple hundred people, and basically asked the question, is this valuable? Mm. And the answer was yes. And largely, I think, the, uh, because of the curation, there was so much happening. Yeah. Someone tell me what matters. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. What do I care about in this space? If I'm a graduating college kid, how do I learn quickly about what's happening in the creator economy? Ooh, I could subscribe to this newsletter and learn, right? So it's like, it just felt right. And so then you know, we, we um, released it, we ran it, we, we ran it for a few months without any sponsorship, it just ran, we acquired um, you know, thousands of readers. And then um, we started getting sponsorships. And then we also realized uh, at some point that this is its own company. It, we have our own writers for the company. It needs to build its own culture. It's, uh, it's its own thing. And we're in the process of that now. It's spun into its own company. And, you know, the original team that helped us and brought on, we brought on as consultants are partnered into it. Mm -hmm. um, we, we own it with, uh, a, a, with two other people. And um, that is, uh, a, a whole experience in and of itself of building another content coming alongside what mm -hmm. we do. Um, but it follows the same thing we know, make content, get sponsors. Yeah. Like those are the things mm -hmm. we know how to do. So we, we, we are in that. When I talk about courses, although it's a value prop extension, it's a different business. Yeah. You know that I've talked to you at length about courses and I'm very overwhelmed by this new business yeah. um, mm -hmm. and ready to get into it now that we have these engines yeah. that we've built. But um, courses is a new business. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different business model. Merchandise is a new business model. These are all new business models, but creating content and selling sponsorship is a business model we are familiar with. That's so interesting. Yeah, I guess value prop extension. Yeah, I guess for us, it's 
the thing that we're good at is creating content and selling courses. And yeah. so when I speak to people who struggle to make courses, I'm like, guys, it's so easy. <laughs> but I'm forgetting yeah, that yeah, like yeah. we've been doing it for a while. Like yeah. I've been making courses yeah. since like 2013. <laughs> like mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I've been doing this you're for a while. Ten now. years of figuring that out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're you're also good though at like taking uh, concepts and uh, boiling them down into simple, like well articulated videos. So yeah, I would say so that the course thing yeah, makes the perfect sense. Yeah. sense. But then us trying to build our own stationary brand, which we tried to do last year. Ugh, right, like, it's like uh, adjacent. Yeah, yeah, adjacent. It's like one thing I'm exploring now mm-hmm. is could we build our own productivity app, which feels like value prop extension in that we help people be more productive mm-hmm. and build a life they love. And it's like cool. Instead of promoting apps that we don't own, can mm-hmm. we promote an app that we do own? Mm-hmm. Turns out making an app is really freaking hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah of course. Yeah, Everyone yeah, I spoke yeah. to is like bloody hell, yeah. this is really hard. And I'm like, okay, well, for, if we made a five dollar a month app for us to make anywhere near the amount of money we could make on a course, it would require like hundreds of thousands of users. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's almost not worth it. Like, right. why are we trying to, like, yeah. Do you invest in a productivity app? Do you have a long-term partnership with a yeah. productivity app? That's what I would explore as a creator. It's like, do yeah. you need to own it? Do you need to be in the software development or app development business? Yeah. Like, Probably not. <laughs> probably not, right? I'd love uh, to be a minority shareholder in a sure. other mm-hmm. productivity and, app that I genuinely use. And, and that's like, available oh, yes. to you. Yeah. After this, you'll get emails from people. and You can yeah. evaluate those. And maybe you can bring on someone on the venture side to be like, hey, you know what? We're, we're going to set aside half a million dollars or yeah. $250,000, and we're going to make uh, $50,000 investments into startups, mm. right? And then you can you can scratch that itch of like, I want this productivity app, but yeah. let me get the people who are committing their life to software yeah. development. Mm-hmm. Let me not pretend <laughs> let's not like, yeah. let's like, not pretend like I'm going to do that. Like, are you ready for 10 years of learning that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everything takes like 10 years. So one, yeah. one, one question I was asking myself uh, when journaling the other day was what would I do if I knew I wouldn't fail? And on that list was I build productivity app. But then I asked myself, well, what would I do even if I knew I would fail? Yeah. And on that list was definitely not building a productivity app. Because <laughs> I was like, absolutely yeah, hell yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, like, if I knew yeah. it was going to fail, why the hell would I build a product? And I was yeah. like, ah, hang on. That's interesting. That's interesting, yeah. Even if I knew I would fail, I, like, one, one thing that was in both lists is I just really like the idea of building, like, a stage show. Like, a one-man stage show. Mm. Like, Darren Brown meets cool. Jay Shetty uh, cool. kind of vibes. Cool. And that would be super fun as a bit of a side, side project, even if it completely failed. Because I would want to combine like magic and music and like mentalism, mind reading type stuff with do you like magic? message. I dabble. Yeah, How I used do I to know that. Uh, you know, I used to do close up magic at parties and balls no at way. university, card tricks and shit. You know, wow. Well, I, would, I, would love, there. I would love to come see that show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that feels really fun. And that that's lit a fire underneath me of like, yeah. oh, this would be really cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But I'm also not imagining it's going to be like a particularly commercially <laughs> yeah. le- mm. legit thing. Yeah, it's just yeah, like, yeah. okay, cool. That's a bit of a, a side hustle. Mm-hmm. But I like this idea of value prop extension. How how do you square the newsletter with the whole focus thing? Because it's not you, you are splitting your focus between like not just focusing on the, the format that works. I think we have sacrificed focus, yeah, to get it off the ground. Mm. There's no doubt in my mind. Yeah, the the fact that we've done what we've done over the past couple of years while also launching that surprises me. And I think there will be a period. There is going to be a period now of getting focus back mm-hmm. as we build it as its own company yeah. truly uh with someone at the helm who probably wakes up every single day and is like this is my sole focus yeah. you know n- not just part of our focus part of our focus is obviously heavily on what we're doing on the colin and samir side part of it is what's happening with the published press yeah i think uh as creators like we're very excited because we are creators the term is like about making things. It's bringing ideas to mm-hmm. life, right? And that's not just video. So like, I think we are great zero to one guys right now. Like we can come up with an idea and and really push it from zero to one. And because of our distribution now, we have an accelerant yeah. attached to that zero to one, right? Which is great. But the one to 10 needs to be done by a seasoned person. And your role in the one to 10 is to continue building your distribution, you know, it's called the published press. That was intentional so that it could scale. Not the Colin and Samir. Yeah. Exactly. The, yeah. Colin and Samir, everything we do with Colin and Samir, unscalable. Yeah. The day we don't want to do it, it's over. Mm. It's an unscalable project and that's okay. But what we want to do is build scalable projects alongside it, right? And so the published press is a scalable project. Um, and that requires team and operators to do that scaling, yeah. right? And and alongside the scaling, we have to continue being the accelerant, which is we have to build our show. 
we have to come on shows like this. We have to be Colin and Samir who own the company, The Published Press, right? And if we can be that alongside seasoned operators who can operate it and hire people and have a company culture there, then we will find success. Um, but it, the push-pull is going to be, can we let go enough to allow that team to develop on their own without us controlling it and being like, that line didn't work. Why did you? And we are those type of guys, right? We are those guys who scrutinize everything um, that goes out. Can we let go of the grip a little bit and play our role in this and allow the team to play their role? Um, and so I think like, I, I, as I look forward, it's like, there's a lot of zero to ones that I'm really excited about. Those are hard and they will sacrifice focus on what we're doing. But you also have to know that you're not the person to go from one to 10. You are not. There's no possible way. You have to be the creator. I need some advice. One thing we are considering doing is launching a daily newsletter called Daily Productivity. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I bought the domain like dailyproductivity.com. Like the Daily Stoic. Kind like of the Daily Stoic, exactly. Yeah. Or like Daily Dad. Like yeah. it's fully inspired by Ryan Holiday. We spoke to Billy and Dawson from his team God, when we were Ryan, in Austin. Ryan's so good. And we were like, okay, that's really cool. Uh, I had um, Alex Lieberman on the pod. Mm -hmm. Like last year, talked about Morning Brew. It was like, that's an interesting model. It's super, super inspired by what you guys are doing at the public at the, at the published press. And the idea being like, can we do Daily Stoic, but like the productivity version where mm -hmm. we give you mm -hmm. a productive, an evidence-based productivity tip or an idea in your inbox every morning for your consideration or something like that, mm -hmm. where it's not tied to my name. Maybe at, for, at the start, it's Daily Productivity by Ali Abdal or something, but like over time, we lose that thing and try and build its own thing around that thing. What do, what do you reckon? <laughs> what are the thoughts that you'd be like, what, what sort of questions would you be asking? What's, how would you approach that? How, how would you write the content? Batch? Like, would you write 365 before you launch it? Uh, probably not. Um, we are thinking we'd write seven and pilot it for seven days um, with our audience and see what happens. And then four weeks from now, decide, are we actually going to do this? Because we're in a bit of a... We're not sure if we want yeah. to do this stage right now. I definitely highly recommend what we did with keeping it yeah. internal. Pilot it internally for yeah. like, like three start months, with yeah. just staff. Okay. And I would think like then friends. Yeah. 60 to 90 days of piloting at Ooh, a minimum. Okay. Yeah. yeah, at a minimum. Mm -hmm. But and I would also in that because what we do is topical. What we do is let me tell you the latest. Let me yeah. tell you what matters. Also be evergreen. Yeah, that's you, that's hard, right? Yeah. And like Daily Stoic is awesome because I can read it three years in a row in terms of the book, yeah. not not the newsletter, but like that's one of the greatest things. Um, I would write 365 before you launch. Mm. Because what you're doing is it's not, it doesn't, it's not tied to the date, right? No, it's not. Yeah. The ones yeah. that we wrote, we couldn't yeah. air. You couldn't, yeah. you couldn't yeah. batch. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah. We, we were writing and they couldn't, but I would write, I would just think about it as like, we're going to spend three weekends writing 365 of these. And once we, cause then you're happy with it. You're happy with the project and then it goes out. Like decouple the production from the distribution hmm. because the overwhelming thing for me is writing 365. And that is what you're doing with the, what's it called? The daily, daily productivity, daily productivity. What you're doing with that is you're building a ritual. Yeah. So if that doesn't hit my inbox at 9am or whatever the time it is, you've, you've fucked my ritual. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you swear on this podcast, but <laughs> yeah, but uh, like you have, you have messed up my ritual um, and you have to think about like ritual based content is about the ritual. I might not care about what you sent on day 120, but my ritual is to click it open and drink my coffee and I'm habit stacking, right? To, to quote James Clear there. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you're building a habit for me. So how do you ensure that you're going to hit me every day at the exact same time? The way I would do that is write it all, be happy with it and then distribute. Yeah. Why 365? Why not like 90? Because I thought you wanted to do it every single. Oh, oh, oh! Why three hundred sixty-five? Yeah. So why would like why why not write ninety issues and then launch it if we're happy with the ninety and uh, then figure it out and then build build the tracks as the train is on the. I, I, I think it depends on your relationship with the content. Yeah. Like I really, I I would struggle if on day ninety-two I didn't like what was written, and it was written by my team or like and it went mm -hmm. out and I had to rush it and I had to make something that I didn't like, I would really struggle with that. And so that's why I say I would want 365 written before it went out. Um, but if you're kind of like, I give it space to be like, I know that some of them are going to be 10 out of 10 and some of them are going to be three out of 10, but in aggregate, the whole project's going to be an eight out of 10. 
then you know maybe you can do that. Uh, but you, I, I don't know how yeah. to get someone else to do that work mm. that that I'm 100% happy with. So I have to have a different relationship with with a lot of the stuff. You may also want to make sure you have an understanding of what is that one out of ten newsletter yeah. send, and yeah. what is the you know five out of ten or whatever it is, yeah. so that you can actually space them out appropriately. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of just you know, like oh, we need to have- winging it, yeah, like yeah. running out yeah, or getting close to running to out. Like, okay. <laughs> then all of a sudden, you may send a five out of ten, a six out of ten, a seven out of ten for multiple but, days in a row. Yeah, uh, and then your quality goes down. But I think you can do the internal thing first, right? And be like, is daily too much or is daily just right? You know, you have to answer that question too as a consumer. Yeah. So I think you have to answer some of those questions first, and then you can make the decision yeah. on what you want to do with the project. But I would batch produce it. That's good. But it sounds right for your brand, obviously. Like mm-hmm. it's a value prop extension. Also, is it a newsletter? Is it a text? Oh. Is it an SMS? Oh. Right? Project through yeah. a community or something like that? Maybe I want it as a text. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there's the option. <laughs> maybe my productivity um, doesn't allow me to, or doesn't, I'm not good at opening my email first thing in the morning, yeah. or maybe. I just want to clear my inbox. I don't want more clutter in there. So mm. give it to me somewhere else. Yeah. Nice. Maybe it's uh, what Ryan did with Daily Stoic in podcast form. And, yeah. you know, you can click a date and hear you say it. I don't know. I, I would really look at like the distribution of it and what's like, what do you like from the distribution? Mm. But just think about those two things, you know, Production you have to and distribution being yeah, they're decoupled. De- they're, they're de- decoupled and they're different and you have to understand both. Um, yeah. Are you glad you have a newsletter business? Yes. Yeah. I, I think uh, based on what I talked about with um, permission and interruption, mm. um, it's a permission-based environment. The people there have given us permission to be in their inbox. They open it when we send. They click on stuff that we recommend. Um, that is a group that I feel like I have a deeper understanding of, that I have uh, a depth of connection with because of the permission they've given us. On YouTube, yep. I, it's harder, right? Because yeah. you're like, I have to interrupt you. Yeah. you know. But I kind of wish I could be like, just, just, just watch whatever I put out. Yeah, you know, but that's not the case. And um, the newsletter format kind of allows us to to have this permission based environment. And if you don't want that anymore, if you don't give us permission anymore, you just unsubscribe, and it's and it's done. So the people who are there, who are opening it, that to me is like yeah. a very core group. Um, yeah, and I also think it's like it's been a really good lesson in scaling. Yeah, I'm happy we honest. tried something yeah. new. Mm. Like it has its own it has its own set of challenges that would not come from having a YouTube channel. And it's interesting to learn about how to build a different type of, slightly different type of product and business and to experience actually even the highs and the wins of like launching cool things with it or seeing people tweet about it yeah. and realizing, oh, I didn't I didn't have much of a hand in that newsletter send that day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's pretty cool that yeah. like something <laughs> yeah. came out of our yeah, camp yeah, that yeah. people yeah. are resonating with. That's really interesting. I think also like uh, we were with Matt from Yes Theory who doesn't watch YouTube, doesn't have Instagram, doesn't really have social media, but reads our newsletter. Mm. And he said to us yesterday, he was like, that's how I keep up with this world. And I was like, that's ex- that's so great. And there's some people who I've gotten messages from who are like, you know, at UCLA or in, in college who are like, this is how I am learning about the job I want to have. And to me, that's the coolest possible thing. And take it a step further, there's people who have been hired because of the job listings we put in there. Mm-hmm. There's creators who hit us up and they're like, hey man, I just hired an editor who applied through your newsletter. Yeah, nice. That's crazy. Like that to me is transformation. And transformation is very energizing and fulfilling as a creator when you know you've transformed someone. Why is going viral a bad thing? I think it's not a bad thing. It's only bad if you take the wrong indicators from it. I think it was MKBHD who said the best thing that never happened to me was having an early video go viral. If you have a video that goes viral as your first one or your second one, and the process was terrible, you didn't like it, but then you just take that as an indicator of that's exactly what I should do, you're going to find yourself in a life that you don't like. So I think it's just about having the understanding of the lifestyle you want if and when virality comes. I, I think sometimes uh, virality it turns you into someone who is uh, constantly seeking that outcome of virality. And um, I think the the thing to seek is the process, right? And so that that's that's my opinion of like, I think as creators, we should be seeking a, a better, more enjoyable process 
not necessarily the outcome. Like the outcome is a byproduct of that process. Um, and so if we're just chasing the outcome, and I, I'm speaking from a space of experience, the dopamine hit of going viral is one, you, uh, of, is one of the most intoxicating things ever. How did you guys feel after your Mr. Beast video? Because that was like 2 million views in like two days. Which one? The, the most recent one, the interview. Oh, I mean, the thing is, you get to a point where you can look at what you're creating and understand what, you know, the, you understand the the, the distribution perspective of that. I think we felt some of our, uh, on the production side, like, we we had wished we had you know asked a few more questions. We had wished we had taken some different angles and like so there yeah. was some of it where we sat down as a team and we were like, how can we do a better job of prepping? Mm. That that's what we took away from that. I I assumed that you know there would be a large audience for that. Yeah. You know yeah. that's not that's yeah. not a surprise. The, uh, the bigger rush was five years ago when yeah. we made a video essay about David Dobrik and he yep. shared it on Snapchat <laughs> and it blew and up, it blew yeah. up like crazy, and you just. Comments are coming in, yeah, and then yeah, you think yeah. this is it. We made it. This is the moment. Everything will change. I, I think the you know one of the the rushes for me came from you know when we did our interview. I felt like it was a great conversation, and I was like, that was a rush. When we did our interview with Dream, it was a rush. When we did our mm -hmm. interview with Destroying, we found places and avenues and uh, learned things. That was like a total rush. We did our interview with Tim Ferriss. It was a rush, and like all of those have different metric numbers next to them from a distribution perspective, but. Process wise, some of those were really, really fun. And I felt like we were really prepped and we um, really just nailed what it meant to be Colin and Samir in that conversation. Same with the Try Guys. I think that was mm -hmm. another one that felt really good. And so some of those, those to me feel really great, but the virality of them is a separate thing. And yeah. that is not entirely up to us. It's it's up to how the audience receives it. Yeah. You're focusing on what you can control. Yeah. yeah, yeah which yeah. is the process mm -hmm. showing up consistently. That's the more succinct way of saying what I just uh, said. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think this is, um, I've, I've recently been reading The Practice by Seth Godin. Oh, such a great book. Um, Dude, and I was I've just been to highlighting the hell yeah. out of it. I'm just like, oh my God, this is the advice I need right now where I'm having yeah. format FOMO. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, you know, maybe I should make more Johnny Harris videos. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to make a Johnny Harris video. <laughs> and like, I've been trying yeah. to. Johnny Harris is Johnny <laughs> Harris because yeah. he knows how to make <laughs> Johnny, Johnny Harris, Harris videos. Yeah. yeah. And then even speaking to you guys over lunch yeah. where I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I should just continue with my three videos a yeah. week that are chill and nice and fun to film and I enjoy making them yeah. or do something completely different for the sake of chasing some numbers. It's like, the, the answer is obvious as I even yeah. as I say it. Yeah, yeah. It's mm -hmm. the process rather than the result. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something in a video around like 12 lessons from 12 years on yeah. YouTube. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned brand is more important than reach in the long term. What do you mean by that? Uh, reach, what we're talking about here, views, is many times filling space on these platforms. If you think about TikTok, shorts, Instagram reels, it's so quick. The, the amount of time that your video will come in there, capture someone's attention, and then they swipe and they move on, you are potentially just filling a void of space for a quick jolt of entertainment or whatever it is. The person who watched your video may not remember who you are, the value that you bring, enough to come back again and again. Like That would be a brand. So we're recommending and urging creators to think about how they can connect with people consistently over time, in a way, so much so that they can have a brand that people will remember. And we've been making uh, comps to Severance, which is such a great show. I haven't seen it. Oh, it's phenomenal. Yeah, okay. It's amazing. Right. And yet it hasn't been on the air in over a year. Right. But when it comes back, I'll watch it because the brand of the show is remarkable. And it's so good that I'll wait for that. And as a creator, you want to try and do a similar thing. You don't want to feel like you have to upload every single day. Mm. Right. Yeah, it's like back in the day when Sam Corder was making videos, it's like every six months, oh, Sam Corder video just dropped. Yeah. And everyone just flocks to it in the sort of travel. Exactly. Film. I don't even like. know if Sam Corder has uploaded in the past year, but if someone told me Sam Corder was working on something, I would think it was premium. Yeah. yeah. When you say <laughs> Sam Corder, right? I see yeah. a sunset yeah. Yeah. in my head, a beach, <laughs> cinematic, super waves. attractive guy doing a backflip. I know. Yeah. Mate, yeah. He, he yeah. actually hit we, me up on Instagram like two days ago. Sam's great. We worked with Sam on a, yeah. on a, on a project uh, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. He's awesome. Yeah, he's so cool. Told I, that, like, honestly, you know what's upsetting is yeah. that he's that attractive and that cool. You know, yeah. yeah, I know it's really unfair. It's like, just you can't have all of it. So and he has like, a brand, yeah, so he can take breaks. Right. Yeah, we don't okay. Know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This was about and brand. Sorry. like a paid yeah. thing yeah, yeah, with yeah. DJI, and it's right. just like, oh, yeah. it's just God. such a good. I'm going to yeah, watch it anyway, yeah, yeah. even though I know it's an ad but for the label. Sam DJI. trades on like brands trade at a premium. Yeah, you know, I don't know how many views Sam Colder's videos get. I don't. But if I was working at a brand, I would want a Sam Colder video. Yeah, 
right? Like if the Jim I was, Chalk video is sick. Yeah, the DJ Jim Chalk video is great. Like, oh, yeah. If I was working <laughs> at, uh, yeah, like DJI, I'd be like, yeah, I want a Sam Colder video. Yeah. Not because of his reach, but because of the brand association. Yeah, yeah we talk you about know? this concept of singularity, that Sam Colder is singular for a lot of people and for a lot of brands. Yeah. DJI might not want just any creator. Yeah, they want, they Sam, want Colder. Sam Colder. Yeah. And that goes for brands too, mm -hmm. right? Coca-Cola doesn't want you to just want any drink. They want it to be Coca-Cola. And so we urge creators to think about that. Of how do you get to a point where you're singular, you're irreplaceable? And we have a worksheet for that Ooh. in our course. Right? Nice. <laughs> that I'm we're building, yeah. That you're building. <laughs> <laughs> When's it going to be released? Uh, I would think September is safe. Um, yeah, September is safe. I, uh, well, yeah, September is a safe bet. Like have we have are, a title for it yet? We have many. Yeah, many titles for it. Uh, we have a whiteboard full of titles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we're, we're closing in on it. I think like we're very uh, confident in the curriculum of it and very confident in the worksheets. Like I think it's a, it's a course that's self-discovery. Like you will discover a lot about yourself. You'll discover a lot about your business um, and you'll come out of the other side being prepped to figure out how to turn what you're doing creatively into a, into a product, into a business. Me, I'm sold. Yeah, there great. you go. That was the sales pitch. That sounds yeah. great. <laughs> Sign me up. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, the brand, brand thing is interesting. Like, I, th I feel like there's a lot of people these days who, especially with the advent of short form content, mm. there are millions of followers, millions of views, and completely broke. Like, is that a pattern that you guys see as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think not only, uh, you know, completely broke or not, it's like millions of views, millions of followers, but could not fill a room if they had an event mm. you know like n nobody really cares um and i think that's because the, the 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 platforms have done this really smart thing right and largely led by tiktok where it was like okay people are here for creators that is pretty volatile creators come and go they could leave they could like hmm. so what tiktok showed everyone is that the platform could be the creator when Wait, you say, you I'm watching TikTok, yeah. you are watching TikTok. There's yeah. very few people who go on TikTok and say, okay, I go on TikTok, I search Ali Abdal, now I'm watching yeah. Ali Abdal, right? Yeah. No, yeah. it's I'm watching TikTok. I'm scrolling the For You page. So TikTok is the creator. Yeah. You take the top 10 creators off of TikTok, TikTok's still TikTok, it's still enjoyable, yeah. right? And so YouTube, I, I believe you take the top 10 creators off YouTube, it's a very different place. Mm. Um, but YouTube was looking at TikTok and saying, hmm, hmm, you know, not only this is what the, the younger generation likes, but it's also a, it's a safer bet for a platform yeah. because if you stop making your videos, is that going to change the shorts feed? No, mm -hmm. no you just replace it, it yeah. with something else. Yeah. yeah. People yeah. may not even notice People, on a short yeah. form feed. Yeah. I, no one's going to be scrolling and be like, interesting. There's no Ollie up yeah, the whole yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> So th like the feed is the creator and that's like a really safe bet for the platforms. But as the creator, you have to recognize that you are not really building your own individual brand. You're playing into the feed and you might be rewarded for playing into the feed, but you are playing into the feed. And it's not to say some creators aren't doing it and building careers and yeah. building communities on short form content. But I think it's way more difficult. Yeah. And there's stick there's some creators who are sticking out dramatically and then they're they're typically though they're like building into a more, you know, kind of sticky format or something that gives them length. Like podcasting is is common if you build um a, a large audience or moving over to long form YouTube videos. Mm. Like long form if you can make it in long form if you can use your short form videos to build your long form videos, then you're in a good place. Hmm. If you guys were, let's say you decided that today you were going to start a YouTube channel, for example, mm -hmm. or what, what would be your balance of long form, short form videos? And how would you go about YouTube versus TikTok versus threads versus all the, all the mm -hmm. 10 different options we have for posting on platforms these days? Like if you were trying to build this creator economy career. I can only speak from a completely biased perspective, which is that I enjoy making long form content for yeah. YouTube because I enjoy watching YouTube. Yeah. I would probably test uh, formats on shorts because I think you need to practice a lot and you need to find your voice. And I think shorts created lower barrier to entry. Like when you say get going, uh, when I think about that, the easiest way for me to get going would be to make short form content, mm -hmm. right? But I think you have to have the understanding that you are doing that to find your voice for long form content. At least for me, I would be like, I'm going to make shorts for a while to test the market, test the audience, find a group of people interested in this subject matter, and then give them long form content. That's what I would do. Nice. 
Uh, Colin, one thing you said that in one of your videos is that you're not working on a YouTube channel, you're working on yourself. What do you, what do you mean by that? Um, I think that with everything, obviously we've been talking a lot about process while we've been here and it's not the final video. People see the final video, right? And maybe they spend 30 minutes, 40 minutes with it. But for me, that was potentially a month of my life. So I need to think about how I spent that month. Did I enjoy it? So with every video, I'm thinking about the process and then trying to adjust, you know? And that's where I think it is this process of like every video, every experience as a part of this channel is an opportunity for me to reflect on myself and how I enjoyed it, how I showed up in that video. Was I proud of that? Mm. Right. I think it's also a lot about like how you choose to spend your time. Like we choose to spend our time making videos that then go out and are, you know, publicly judged or validated. You know, like wh why do, I, I always think about this, like why do I do this? And I think whatever you're doing, whether it's making videos or yeah. entrepreneurship, like it's all a process of self-discovery. Why am, like who am I that I care about this so much? That's what you're figuring out with every step of the way. You know, like next year, am I going to want to upload more videos or less videos? And what does that mean about me? Do I want to make more money? Why do I want to make more money? What do I care about? What's my value system? Mm, do I'm I, not going to care about everything we do equally. Yeah. Right? You're going to care about things differently. And even the way you care about something is going to change. Yeah. Right? It'd be impossible for me to say I care equally about like our Discord, our newsletter, our interviews. Yeah our Twitter account, our Instagram account, right? That's all going to fluctuate and and I have to take stock of that and make mm. decisions based off of how I feel. If you guys won the lottery and you had 100 million in the bank, what would change about the way you spend your time, if anything? I, I don't, I think I would have coffee with more people and feel okay about that. Like feel okay about um, spending a little bit more time and moving slower. Um, I think that would be one big thing. I, I know that's so achievable, but like this exercise is, I, I think whenever I do this exercise, it's to reveal like what is achievable in your life right now. Cause at least for mm -hmm. me, most of what I want is very achievable. I just have to like uncover it. Um, I think it would just be like time. I would, I would treat things. Um, I would give time to more things. Like I would move a little slower in my creation, um, so that I could have more time for other things. I would also build a recording studio so that musicians could come in and record and I nice. could just be there. That's been and one of my dreams for really? at some point when I settle down yeah. and have a, a studio space. I, I want to yeah. have like yeah. a creative campus somewhere like out in nature where people can come and create things. <sighs> yeah, that would be um, sick. I think we're just describing Rick Rubin's Shangri-La. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right yeah. yeah, but yeah. I have a friend who's doing it in Taos, New Mexico. Right. He bought a bunch of land and he's building a recording studio there and he's doing like artist residencies. Oh, and like, That's really popular. So writer, writers go there to hang yeah, out. Writers stuff, there yeah, writers go there in Taos. So he's doing that as well. There's, there's writers who are coming and like to be around that to be a part of that to enable that to absorb that like just creative people exploring creative things and specifically music for me is really important and i haven't gotten to be around it since i was in high school mm. i'd love to be back around music so I, I would just spend my time differently that's it you know like you just spend your time on things that are are enjoyable and exciting but i am a creative person i enjoy creating i would always create mm. i'm not creating you know, purely because I think it's a good uh, financial decision. I think there's a lot easier ways to make money than what we do. So if it was about, you know, generating money, I would do something different. <laughs> I think I would open up a budget for myself, friends, and particularly my family to fly either like first class or private yep. to come see me or for me to go see <laughs> yeah. them uh, and cool. try and minimize yeah. the gap yeah. of time that we don't see each other and make it really easy. Hmm. That's cool. Would you continue to do the the show, the Colin and Samir show? A hundred percent. Yeah, without yeah. question. Not, yeah. That would be awkward if, but if you yeah. had different answers to that. Or if we both said no. This thing? No, oh, we God. hate each other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah without a doubt. I, yeah. I mean, like, my answer is, like, so vehemently yes, because the people that we meet. Yeah. Like, like I said, what I would do is, like, have coffee with interesting people. I, I have a formula and a format to do that that allows for, um, you know, a Ryan Holiday to come and sit with us for three hours. Like I, we have that. So 
it's great. Yeah. yeah. Like that is, yeah. that is great. I would do more of it. And some of it I would do off the mic. Back in the day, the advice that you would often hear about growing a YouTube on YouTube or podcast, or whatever is the jab, 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 right hook thing of like, give away loads and loads and loads of free content. This is the, the, the Gary V, Gary V, uh, Gary V model. A jab is giving away free content and you do jabs for like 50 times before you land a right hook. The right hook is the ask, the selling something. Mm -hmm. And so the whole vibe was spend ages building an audience with free, with free content. You build an audience of people who know, like, and trust you. And then when you decide to sell something, there will be people who are willing to buy it. I feel like that formula is sort of changing, but I wonder to what extent, like, what are your guys' views on how long should you spend building and creating free stuff before thinking about monetization? When you're saying free stuff, are you saying ad supported stuff? Oh yeah, I mean like videos on YouTube, for example, that just have AdSense behind them. Before you start selling a product? Uh, before you start selling a product, yeah, for example. Yeah, so uh, that depends on if you have a value prop extension that is a product, right? Like, or like, it could be a digital product, could be a physical product, but like one yeah, of yeah. the greatest things about YouTube specifically um, that is completely insane is that you can just create content. And if you create a certain type of content, you just magically receive a check every month. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't want to oversell that. That's yeah. hard to do. But if you're that type of creator who can do it, that's the highest margin creative business that I've ever seen. Mm. What, what You don't have to get on the phone with an advertiser. You don't have to read a contract. You don't have to negotiate a rate. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you're making stuff and a check comes. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> pretty mental. Yeah. you really mm -hmm. think about that. Yeah. And like, I, to me, sometimes I think it's crazy when creators complain about AdSense or, or ad rates because it's like it's not in our control. Like this is, a, this is not our platform. It's we, you know, yes, we make up the platform, but like we don't, I don't know, this thing is crazy that they just pay us. And some of the ad rates are ludicrous that you see. You're like, oh my God. And it's also the only game in town. Yeah. yeah. For the most part. Mm. There aren't any other platforms who are but, offering splits like this at rates like this. I think there's some tangibility that we can talk about of like, when should you sell something? And, you know, what we look at is like views from subscribers, returning viewers, like, do you have a healthy community? Are they actually coming back? Or are you just really good at making titles and thumbnails that are reaching a completely new audience every time you upload? Um, I wouldn't sell something if you are reaching a viral new audience every time you upload. You could have, you know, 5 million views of video, but it's new audience and they're kind of there just for entertainment. They don't want to buy something from you. But that could turn into a great sponsorship business and a great advertising business. Um, if you have like 10 to 20,000 people who are coming back every single time, you're like, okay, there's something here. Do I have an extension of my value that I can offer to them? But it's going to be subjective. Like again, back to the athlete thing. That's like, you know, it's tough to say it's yeah. based on the athlete. Hmm. Nice. Final question. Um, what are you guys working on for the next six months up until the end of the year? We are working on our course. That is like one of the biggest things that we are working on. Um, I would, a bunch of interviews. Yeah. I mean, we're here filming interviews. We're working on, you know, building our engine and, and solidifying our engine and, and making sure that we have great interviews and content on our channel that provides the value that we've promised. That's like number one, right? That always has to be number one on your priority list as a creator. Um, and then, you know, number two, as we feel like the engine is getting more stable, is, is building out these new value prop extensions, continuing to build out the Publish Press newsletter with the team that's there. Um, and building this course, which is a completely new business, completely mm -hmm. new thing, a completely new cycle of creation and self-doubt and, you know, pricing and yeah. uh, customer experience and student experience and design and funnels and acquisition, mm -hmm. all these new words that, you know, aren't familiar to us, we're learning. And it's taking us a lot longer than I think we anticipated. Um, but I feel really confident in the curriculum. We have a lot of learning to do on how to be an Ali Abdal, um, but we are we are learning. And that everything takes longer than you think, and this is taking us longer than we think. And that's what we're gonna commit the next six months to is extending this value prop into paid education. Nice. And any final pieces of parting wisdom for anyone who's listened to the three hours of this podcast so wow. far? Wow. Oh if you're goodness. here, yeah. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the deep end. Welcome to the deep end here. As um, we call it. We're, we, do we dove really deep in this. Uh, any parting words of wisdom. Um, find as much time as you can to spend time with yourself. For me, that has come through the practice of, of writing and journaling. Um, I can't recommend that enough. Um, but if that's something different for you, if that's listening to music and going on a walk, like, like we said, all of this is self-discovery, whether it's entrepreneurship or creativity. 
And in order to do that, you have to create space and time for you to spend time with yourself. Uh, I would say uh, one of the books I've really been enjoying, and we bring it up all the time, is Rick Rubin's The Creative Act, The Way of Being. And he talks about how being an artist is about practicing the art of awareness. And I think that has to do with what Samir is talking about, of like spending time with yourself and being aware. So much of this career for us has been about having a heightened sense of awareness for what's comfortable, what's uncomfortable, what's the right type of discomfort, what's the wrong type of discomfort. And so I think uh, make sure to build that muscle of awareness. I think that's what will ensure a sustainable long-term career. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so that's it for this week's episode of Deep Dive. Thank you so much for watching or listening. All the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching or listening to this. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, then do please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It really helps other people discover the podcast. Or if you're watching this in full HD or 4K on YouTube, then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. And if you enjoyed this episode, you might like to check out this episode here as well, which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.